Hi, Lindsay. Hi. Just thought I'd check in. Hi. Have we got all three of our presenters here? Yeah, let's see. We have Carla. Hi, Carla. Hi. Hi. Hi, Lindsay. How's everyone going? How's it going? Hi. Just thought oh, it's I'd going check in. Have great. <laughs> it's exciting to be here. here. And yeah, thank you for having me again. Carla. It's just Hi, Carla. an amazing Hi. experience. Hi. Absolutely. How's everything um, and I see that John going? Thorne is logged in. So if he's not oh, here physically great. right now, I think he'll join us there. soon. Yeah. And then we yeah, also have Ethan. Is that right? Yeah, it's an amazing experience. I don't think Absolutely. he's logged in just um, yet. And I see that John mm -hmm. Thorne is logged in. So if he's not here, yeah. it's really nice to see you, right Lindsay. Now. Thank you so much for being here tonight to moderate. Have Ethan. Oh, it's a pleasure. Any chance to talk about Twin Peaks, of course. I don't think Absolutely. he's logged in. Absolutely. Yeah. I see that John yeah. is logged in. Um, I just well, actually have a question about, really I mean, are you being Lindsay. really so sticklers about time and do you want me to keep oh, it's a pleasure. Yeah. Any chance track of people? Peaks, of course. I don't think it really would be amazing if we could make sure that each yeah. person doesn't go um, over five well, minutes extra. That would be fab. Are you being yeah. really and we have been keeping questions till the keep... very end so that everybody yeah. does their presentation yeah. and we make sure that everybody has their go. It would be amazing mm -hmm. if we could make sure that and each person doesn't go over five minutes And I've got the YouTube link up, so obviously I just extra. keep that would be fab. going between and we have been the YouTube link and the Zoom the chat end, just to get get all the questions. If you want to, I can also drop them in the go. zoom chat for you because i know it can be a little destabilizing to go back and forth between the windows that would be that'd be great yeah that might help yeah. Well. yeah all right um oh yeah if, if it for the present more well, than the presenters aren't here yet but because i know it can be a little destabilizing to go back and forth between the windows although carla yeah if i could just ask how do i um pronounce the name of the institute that you're at oh god um just it's just institute of lexicography in Zagreb. Um, it's it's fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, it's a self-cutilage, but it, it's hard to pronounce, I think. So, yeah, it's all good. Um, pronounce the name of the institute that you're at. Oh, God. Um, just the institute of lexicography We had a special Zagreb. request it's, it's from <laughs> Lee Richards, who I think is still logged in. She asks that everyone who has a cat at home, please show yourself with your cat. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's not a Zoom okay. conference without a cat. <laughs> we had a special. Yeah, I'm not sure. I have a cat and it's just super cute, but uh, sometimes he meows when I speak over phone and like when I Skype and such. So yeah. it, it wouldn't be convenient. It's not a Zoom conference without a cat. <laughs> He's very rude. Yeah, uh, sure. Or if he wants to chat as well. So. Cute, if there's a lull in the Q and A, bring the cat out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I could, I could. So it wouldn't be convenient. Oh, Frank is trying to outdo us with his nice backdrop. He has a new one every panel. Hi, Frank. Statue of David Lynch's father, isn't it? Oh, Frank is trying to outdo us with his nice backdrop. He has a new one every panel. Hi, Frank. It's been so great this weekend to see all the people that we are normally in contact with, either on social media or through your texts or reading your books. Um, it's been really, really great to see and hear everyone. It's such a treat. It's been so great this weekend to see all the people that we are normally in contact with either on social media. Welcome to those who are just tuning in. We're going to get started in a great minute's time. See and hear everyone. It's such a treat. Do we have Ethan here yet? All the people that we are normally in contact with either on social media. Welcome to those who are just tuning in. It doesn't look like it. get started in a great minute's time. People have been hopping in pretty much on time, so... I'm not panicking yet. People have been hopping in pretty much on time, so I'm not panicking yet. Welcome to those who are just it doesn't look We're like going it. To get started in a great minute. People have been hopping in pretty much on time, so I'm not panicking yet. Do we have 
Welcome to those who are definitely it doesn't need look like it. Get started in a minutes. People have been hopping in pretty much on time, so here he comes. <laughs> Hi there, Ethan. Welcome. Hi. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. How are you? I'm doing all right. Looking forward to this. It's us too. Thanks for being here. Of course. Thanks for having me. Hi there, Ethan. So I think we have all of our Hi. panelists now and Lindsay Hallam. Fine, Is that the correct you? pronunciation of your family name? Doing all right. Yeah. Looking forward to this. Great. Us too. So as you here. may know already, Lindsay Hallam has agreed to be our moderator this evening. Either so we're either. really lucky we to have, have her. panelists now right. and Lindsay Hallam. Is that the correct here. pronunciation of your family name? All right. Yeah. yeah. To this. Great. Us too. So which cat? You, I know you have several already. cats. Lindsay which cat has front has agreed to be our moderator this evening. Either so we're either. really lucky to have, have, have her. He's got Barnaby. Barnaby. Is that the correct pronunciation of your family name? But Barnaby is a female. Great. <laughs> so which cat? I know you have several cats. Which cat is front dog? Has agreed to be our moderator this evening, so we're really lucky to have her. He's got Barnaby. Barnaby. <laughs> Hi, John. Welcome back. But Barnaby is a female. Great. So we can't hear you just yet. Which cat is front dog? You're not muted, but we don't have any sound. He's got Barnaby. Barnaby. Maybe it's a headset issue. Well. Ah, there we can go. You, can you hear me now? We can't hear you just yet. I'm seeing thumbs up. Okay. Uh, you're <coughs> Good. not muted, but we don't have any sound. Maybe it's a headset issue. Well, ah, there we can go. You, can you hear me now? We can't hear you just yet. I'm seeing thumbs up. Okay. Uh, you're Good. not muted, but we don't have any sound. Maybe it's a headset issue. Well, there we can go. You, can you hear me now? We can't hear you just yet. I'm seeing thumbs up. Okay. Uh, you're <clears> not <throat> muted, but we don't have any sound. Maybe it's a headset issue. Well, ah, there we go. Can you hear me now? We can't hear you just yet. I'm seeing thumbs up. Okay. You're not muted, but we don't have any sound. Hey, John, nice to see you here. Uh, yes, nice to see you. I'm not sure who said that. <laughs> Roland from Linson. Oh, hey, how are you? Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah, it's good to see all, hey, all Joe, you folks. Nice so some of you I've met before. I met Lindsay uh, yes, at the UK said that. Fest, <laughs> or, I guess it was like 2018, I think. Um, oh, hey, how are you? Your book had just come yeah. out, as I recall. I had got it like literally yeah, that morning. You, you folks. So yeah. You, uh, it arrived yeah. on my doorstep. Uh, that's right. That's right. What a great time for it to come, right? Yeah. As a yeah. festival. I guess it was like yeah. Yeah. And I got my, my tattoo like, to, uh, to commemorate. Your book Very good. As I, I had got it like literally yeah. that morning. That was great. Yeah. Festival. Yeah. Yeah. It was great. Uh, that's right. Uh, that's too right. bad there won't be more. I enjoyed that one a lot. Well, that's the first yeah. and yeah. only time uh, you know, I've yeah. been able to go to that one. Good. I know, and I live in London, and that was the first time and only time that I was able to go. Uh, it was yeah. great. Um, it's too bad Same. to read more. I enjoyed that one a lot. That's the first. Hopefully, there will be um, there will be future gatherings of the Twin Peaks um, fans and scholars in the future. Um, once the world gets past some of what we're going through, maybe we can uh, find a way to to get together. I hope so. There will be future gatherings of the Twin Peaks um, fans. Something that's affordable because sometimes these these Twin Peaks events they can be a bit expensive. It's a bit. Uh, yeah, that <clears throat> that uh, Twin Peaks event they were going to do at Graceland to get together last year, which of course got canceled because of the pandemic. Mm. I, I think they uh, overestimated what people were going to pay to go to that because as the months went by, the, the, the cost of attending kept going down and down and down. They're trying to get people to come. Um, I, I never happened, so I don't know if they'll, if they'll try again. 
because as mm -hmm. the yeah, that, months that went by, the, the, the cost of attending kept going down. Welcome down to those who are just joining us. Oh, we'll get started in about uh, five minutes. Kind of happened, so mm -hmm. I don't know if they'll, we're going to pay, they'll try again. Welcome to those who are just joining us. We'll get started in about five minutes. Marisa, I have two surprise messages to share before the <laughs> that sounds exciting <laughs> virtual <laughs> guest marisa i have two uh, surprise messages to share before the <laughs> that sounds exciting <laughs> virtual guest marisa i have two uh, it was very exciting last night we got to meet three of the the woodsmen they were very endearing very very nice guys what a great mood that was it was like if uh, we were in the middle of uh, their discussion we got to meet three of the the woodsmen they were very they have a great dynamic together they seem like really really good pals what a great mood that was it was like if, uh, we've also had we raging storms yeah. yesterday and today in France. We've had all these severe thunderstorms. They have a warning, so there's together. crazy Very stuff like happening really outside our windows here. And we are constantly concerned about power outages. It seems pretty it calm like now, we but had there were a few moments when we were yesterday and today pretty worried about losing connections. And it's coming morning, back so here. Crazy yeah. stuff yeah. Happening Not too close for the moment, here. but it's coming back. And we are constantly <laughs> concerned about power outages. I think it's heading it south towards you, now, Roland, because we here it's, yeah. it's a little better. Pretty worried yeah. about losing connections. And it's coming back here. You've got electricity in the air. It's coming back. It knows. It knows it's happening now. I think. Yeah. Heading south towards you, Roland, because here exactly. it's a little better. <laughs> and yesterday we had the electricity plus the woodsman at the same time. Mm -hmm. You've got electricity in the uh, No portals? It knows, it knows it's happening now. None that we know of just yet. <laughs> I'm not even sure what year it is. Maybe we're in the wrong timeline. Recording in progress. That's always a scary thing to hear. This is just a recording for our archives. See in the comments, our Emiliano was was here last night. Yeah, that was so nice. Are you in Italy? I'm wondering if you had terrible storms as well. <laughs> oh, Vancouver. Okay, yeah, that's a little different. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, one minute to go, and then we'll get started. Josh, is everything okay getting ready for the, the YouTube live feed? Fantastic, thanks. Okay, it's nine o'clock. So before I pass the floor to Roland to make a, a special announcement, perhaps, um, I just want to say welcome back to everyone. Uh, welcome to those who are joining us for the first time. Welcome back to those who have been following along this weekend. Thanks so much for, for joining us and for hanging in. Um, we've had some really great panels, and there are still two more to go that we're really, really excited about. Um, just a brief thank you to our partners, three universities that have been really instrumental in helping us get this um, conference going, and they are the University of Bordeaux-Montaigne in France, 
the University of Liège in Belgium and the University of Cork in Ireland. A huge thanks to them. And we also really want to thank the David Lynch School of Cinematic Arts. They sponsored our Zoom upgrade, which allowed us to accommodate a lot of people in the Zoom, as well as via the YouTube live feed. Um, so my name is Marisa Hayes. I am one of the co-organizers with Franck Bouleg of Unwrapping the Plastic and Roland uh, Camarac from uh, Lynchland. So as I said, we'll also be doing a YouTube live feed. Hello to all the YouTubers. And I'll be going back and forth between the YouTube chat box and the Zoom chat here if you have questions and comments that you'd like to share throughout the evening. Um, but I'll pass the floor now to Roland because I think he has some special news for us. Yeah, I've got uh, two messages uh, to share. Uh, first one from uh, Sabrina Sutherland, Twin Peaks uh, producer, David Lynch theater producer, etc. And Sabrina uh, said, I wish you all the very best. And then I have also received uh, an email from uh, Mike himself, Art Trouble, and I'll say, may the conference achieve great success. Please say hi to everybody for me. So here's you are. Thanks, Thanks so much, Ronald. That's fantastic. Okay, so welcome to panel nine. We are really delighted to have Lindsay Hallam with us. Lindsay teaches film studies at East London University, and she is also the author of a very beloved volume in the Devil's Advocate series. Uh, she wrote a book about Twin Peaks, Fire Walk With Me, which I think many of us here are familiar with. So it's an honor to have you, Lindsay. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you so much for asking me, and it's wonderful to be amongst all the, what do we call ourselves, peakies, peakers, whatever. But um, uh, so I'm very, very happy to be uh, moderating this panel. So this, um, we're, we're looking at mythology and philosophy. So, you know, getting towards the end of the, the conference, it's time to get kind of deep and spiritual with it. So um, we've got three kind of fascinating uh, papers lined up. Um, so shall I just start kicking it off with our first panelist? Yep. All right. Um, so our first panelist doesn't need much of an introduction, I'm sure, for most of you, but just a bit of background. We have John Thorne, um, who holds a Master of Arts in Television Radio Film from Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas. He's the co-editor of the Twin Peaks magazine, Wrapped in Plastic, which I'm sure we're all familiar with. Um, co-editor of the Twin Peaks magazine, the Blue Rose magazine, another beloved magazine. Um, author of the book, The Essential, Wrapped in Plastic, co-editor of the Kindle ebook, Twin Peaks in the Rearview Mirror, Mirror, appraisals, reappraisals of the show that was supposed to change TV. So John Thorne is with us today to um, deliver his paper, 10 is the number of completion. Laura Palmer as the Hindu avatar Kalki and her revised narrative purpose in Twin Peaks, The Return. So John, I don't know if you want to share your screen and take it away. You bet. All right. Thank you, Lindsay. I appreciate it. Um, uh, let's see. Um, get this going. And can everyone see that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, the title for my presentation today is um, Laura is the One. Uh, Laura Palmer as Kalki, the 10th avatar of the Hindu deity Vishnu. Um, in this presentation, I'm going to try to offer uh, one interpretation of who or what I think Laura Palmer is uh, in Twin Peaks The Return. Um, there's certainly other ways of looking at the character, but I think this is uh, somewhat compelling. And so uh, it's one that works for me. Um, if um, the mystery of the original Twin Peaks was who killed Laura Palmer, I think um, one mystery in particular of Twin Peaks The Return is what is Laura Palmer? And um, I ask that question because we all know um, what happens in part eight or what we think happens in part eight. And that is uh, the fireman who we knew as the giant from the original series inexplicably, seemingly creates Laura Palmer and then sends her 
to Earth. And this kind of turns the narrative on its head a little bit because we thought we knew who Laura was. Um, we'd been familiar with her story for so many years. We'd seen her story dramatically depicted in Firewalk with me. And now all of a sudden we have this new material that we have to um, try to make sense of. And um, it, it's, it, it's somewhat confusing because it looks on one level like maybe he's sending her uh, to Earth to co combat Bob because this is something we are familiar with and we've seen happen. But I think there's more to the story than that. There's two things to keep in mind when we try to look at um, how Laura has been, uh, her, her role has been maybe changed in Twin Peaks to Return. Um, the first thing is, um, David Lynch's interest in the character over the 30 year narrative. Um, he has been coming back to Laura Palmer from almost since the beginning and revising and expanding and changing her role in the story. Uh, the second important thing for us to keep in mind is um, Hinduism as it relates to David Lynch, his, um, uh, his belief essentially in Hindu philosophy. So we'll start with David Lynch and Laura Palmer. And as I said, um, you know, you go all the way back to the very beginning of uh, the story, right to the pilot of Twin Peaks, and you can see that David Lynch has an interest in returning to this character of Laura Palmer and expanding her role from what we thought it was. Um, in the pilot of uh, Twin Peaks, Laura Palmer is essentially a victim of murder, and the investigation begins. But when Lynch is tasked with adding 15 new minutes to the pilot to make it a closed end story, what many people call a European version. Um, he brings Laura Palmer back and he makes her this enigmatic figure, this character who is full of secrets. He essentially brings her back to life and he wants to, to say, well, you know, she's still an important part of the story, despite essentially having just been a victim of murder. Now, when Lynch returned to Twin Peaks in the second season, um, he directed the second season premiere of, of, the, of Twin Peaks, and he added a scene that was not scripted. And this scene uh, is, shows the character of Harriet Hayward reciting a poem about Laura Palmer. One of the particular lines in it is, it was Laura and the glow was life. And the poem essentially is uh, reestablishing the importance of Laura Palmer in the story, a reminder from Lynch that Laura is still a presence. Uh, she is perhaps still living in some sense. And so this was another effort at Lynch coming back to the story and bringing Laura into it, making her an essential component. And we all know, of course, that uh, after the series was over, uh, Lynch returned to make Firewalk with me. And here, the most, most dramatically, he returns to the character of Laura Palmer. And here what he's trying to do is essentially give Laura agency over her fate. He wants to make her less a dramatic object and more a dramatic subject. He wants her to have some control over her story. And indeed, I think he successfully does this in Firewalk With Me. He, he makes Laura vital again. Um, vital to the story. You know, after he did Firewalk with me, he returned to Twin Peaks again to do what's called the Log Lady introductions. And these were short pieces that he did for a rebroadcast of Twin Peaks on cable TV. And in the very first Log Lady introduction, the Log Lady, and these were written and directed by David Lynch, the Log Lady says, Laura is the one. And so right from the start, the Log Lady is reminding us about the importance of Laura, and she's making the character central to the story. I mean, this is Lynch, again, telling us Laura is important. Laura is essential to the whole story. 30 years pass, and David Lynch returns to Twin Peaks The Return, and he again makes Laura Palmer a critical component of the story. And he reminds us of the importance of Laura in every single opening credit sequence uh, of the 18 parts. He shows us her uh, angelic face uh, in, in the opening credits, and it's a reminder that she is there, even if the story doesn't seem to be um, ostensibly or directly about her, Lynch wants us to know it is about her. She is crucial to this story, and he he does this by uh, showing her in uh, every opening uh, credit sequence. Now he's going. Where I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about how he revised her, but it's good to remember something that Mark Frost 
uh, told David Bushman in, in the book Conversations with Mark Frost. Frost notes that Lynch could not let go of Laura Palmer as a character. And Frost says there was something about her that just possessed him. He, he kept coming back to her. And Frost acknowledges that it was more Lynch's obsession than his. So I think this allows us to see that it was really David Lynch who, um, who was concerned and, and, and devoted to this character and wanted to um, explore the character more, revise, expand her role. So that's David Lynch and, and the history he has with Laura Palmer. The next thing we need to talk about is David Lynch and Hinduism. Um, it's common knowledge among people who study David Lynch that um, the Hindu teachings and Hindu philosophy are important parts of his life. Um, we, he's spoken in interviews many times about the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. Um, he, David Lynch, is a proponent of transcendental meditation. These are things that inform uh, his worldview. Um, he's also quoted from Hindu holy texts that are also known as the Vedic texts. Um, the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita, the Ramayana, and the Yoga Sutras are all quoted in, in Lynch's short uh, memoir, Catching the Big Fish. Uh, these are quotes we see at the beginnings of chapters again and again. Um, so Hindu philosophy is important to David Lynch, and it's important in his life, and I think it's important in the art that he makes. Um, I'm not the only one who's noted that. Um, one of the prominent Lynch scholars, Martha Nockmson, has noted that David Lynch's work is inflected by exposure to Vedic wisdom, inflected by exposure to the Hindu texts, the Hindu philosophies that Lynch talks about in interviews. So um, we see some of that um, in works before Twin Peaks The Return, particularly in the movie Inland Empire. Uh, arguably, there's a lot of uh, Hindu concepts there. Um, but it's certainly a part of uh, Twin Peaks The Return, uh, perhaps most notably in the line, we are like the dreamer who dreams and lives inside the dream. And this line comes up a number of times in Twin Peaks The Return, and it originates in the Hindu text, the Upanishads. And it's a critical component of the story, and it's actually one of many um, Hindu beliefs that are um, uh, present in Twin Peaks The Return. Um, one Hindu belief is the idea of different ages, that there is a cycle of ages that we go through. And, and Lynch has uh, spoken of this in interviews um, more, more than once. Um, the, the ages that uh, Lynch talks about are the Golden Age, the Silver Age, the Bronze Age, and the Iron Age. And these are four distinct ages that we cycle through. Humanity and the world cycles through um, uh, over and over again. And Lynch has noted that he, we, uh, at this time, and I would argue the characters that he depicts in Twin Peaks in The, the Return, um, are currently in the Iron Age, what Lynch calls the Dark Age. So um, we see the idea of the Dark Age come up in Twin Peaks The Return. We have the character Janie E. Jones explicitly say we are living in a dark, dark age. We also have the Log Lady talk about, and Log Lady is a very reliable character who knows a lot, and um, she tells Deputy Hawk uh, about the idea of, of living in a dark age and asks the question, what will be in the darkness that remains? So the concept of the dark age, and perhaps nearing the end of the dark age, is there in Twin Peaks The Return. Now, Hindus... Um, the Hindu belief system uh, posits that there are supreme deities. Um, Vishnu and Lakshmi are, are two of them in particular. Now, Vishnu is uh, sort of a grand deity that monitors the universe. And over the course of those four ages, Vishnu sends 10 avatars to Earth to help humanity. When there's various crises that occur, Vishnu sends uh, avatars to help humanity through those crises, and overcome whatever hardships they're facing, and then move on. But Vishnu's 10th avatar is his final avatar. The 10th avatar is Kalki. And Kalki is sent to Earth at the end of the Dark Age to essentially restart the cycle of ages, to bring an end to that dark age and start the cycle over again. Kalki is a figure who's often depicted carrying a flaming sword and most notably riding a white horse. Um, 
we can map some of these characters to characters that we see, these figures, these Hindu figures, to characters that we see in the return. I think an argument can be made that the fireman, who we knew as the giant from the original series, is Vishnu. Uh, the giant is monitoring the universe. He literally has a monitor, which he can look out and, and see the world. And he gets an alarm that goes off at a certain point and it triggers him. He goes and he sees what's happening and he sees that there's been this atomic explosion. And this notifies him that essentially the dark age is coming to an end. This is a sign that the, that the dark age is nearing its completion. And so he creates uh, Kalki and Kalki is his 10th avatar, Laura Palmer. And he sends Laura Palmer to earth. Um, Kalki, as I said, is a figure that is associated with a white horse. And as soon as we see Laura Palmer the first time in part two of The Return, and she leaves the Red Room, we see an image of a white horse. That white horse is immediately connected to <clears throat> Laura Palmer. But the white horse imagery appears again and again in connection with Laura. Um, in Laura Palmer's alter ego guise as Carrie Page, we see white horses around her. Um, in the diner that she works, Judy, there's a small children's uh, rocking horse, one of those coin operated rides. It's a white horse and it's outside the entrance of the diner. Most notably is the small white horse statue that is on Carrie slash Laura's mantle in her home. So those are two white horses connected to uh, Laura. Um, dramatically, we also see Laura Palmer wearing a horseshoe necklace. And um, again, we're having horse symbolism connected to Laura. Um, in the return, the number 10 is defined to us as the number of completion. And we are told that the numbers two, five, and three add up to 10, and that these numbers occur time and time again. So there's this idea of a cycle happening, and that 10 essentially is the end of that cycle. We do see these numbers, two, five, and three, in dialogue. We see them on the faces of clocks a number of times. We see them on handwritten notes. Um, so in Twin Peaks, 10 essentially represents the end of the cycle. It's the number of completion. And we have to remember, Kalki is the 10th avatar. She represents the end of the Dark Age. The Log Lady essentially tells us that Laura is Kalki. In some cryptic clues that don't make sense maybe on the first reading, when she's talking to Hawk, she explicitly says the circle is almost complete. And she's talking about the darkness, the Dark Age, that that circle is almost over. And then she says explicitly, Laura is the one. Now, it, again, it may not make sense on the first reading, but when you read the, read the whole text and you go back and you look at these uh, lines from the Log Lady, you begin to see that, that there is this, um, this hint, at least, the suggestion that Laura is this important figure who's going to end the Dark Age. And that really is the summary of, I think, the clue, the main clues that um, I provide a, here about connecting Laura with Cal Key. But we can't forget that Laura Palmer died in Firewalk With Me. I mean, we can't forget what, uh, what happened to her, the story that we knew before. It's true, Laura did die. But the return is very quick to tell us that uh, Laura Palmer had a role after death. Laura tells Cooper in part two, as soon as we see her, I am dead, yet I live. And the log lady, again, our very reliable uh, figure of the, the log lady tells us that death is just a change, not an end. And so even though Laura died in Firewalk With Me, Lynch is revising the character again. He's coming back to her and he's saying, look, she's still got this important role to play. And I might argue that, that maybe Laura couldn't become Kalki, this, this important figure, until she understood firsthand the horrors of the Dark Age. And she went through quite a bit of horror herself when she was alive. So um, what about Dale Cooper? That's another important figure we have to, to consider. And the return is primarily about Dale Cooper and about the story that he goes through. Um, we can't forget that Dale Cooper and Laura Palmer are tied together, and they have been since the beginning of the story. Um, they, um, uh, when David Lynch added that, um, 
uh, European ending, he made sure that we, he, had, he had Dale Cooper meeting Laura Palmer and he was connecting them. Um, so Cooper and Laura are tied together. Lynch also tells us in an, an episode that he directed in the original series that Cooper is probably a Buddhist. He is um, a figure who um, uh, is concerned about the people of Tibet. Uh, he's concerned about the Dalai Lama, and he exhibits behaviors that we might uh, um, associate with a Buddhist. Now, uh, some believe that in Hindu theology, that Vishnu's ninth avatar is in fact Buddha, and that Buddha is sent to earth to prepare the world for the coming of Kalki. It's interesting that at the very beginning of the return, we have the fireman whom I would equate with Vishnu, essentially assigning Cooper uh, a mission. It's cryptic, it doesn't make a lot of sense, Cooper says he understands. I'm not sure he entirely he does. But nevertheless, Cooper has a, a role connected to Kalki. And that role essentially is to deliver Laura Palmer to the end of the Dark Age. He finds her at last. He drives her into this endless night. And I would argue he drives her to the end of time, to a specific place where she can fulfill her role. And that role, of course, is to scream and end the dark age. And in fact, that's how the story ends. Laura screams and everything ends at that point. And I'd like to think that, um, you know, Laura ended the dark age and also started the golden age again. Uh, but we, we don't see that. We see just the end of the dark age because we um, are part of that dark age and we can't see past it. So here I think, you know, David Lynch is assigning Laura Palmer the most important role of all. He is making her this figure, uh, a figure of renewal and rebirth. Um, what I like to call the Omega and the Alpha of Twin Peaks. Omega, because she ends the story, she ends the Dark Age, she brings a, a, an end to the cycle. And Alpha, because there's hope, at least I like to think there's hope, that the Golden Age is going to begin. And that's what she is bringing to us. Uh, we don't see it, as I said. Uh, but the Hindus believe that uh, the cycle begins again. So there's one last clue I think that's important to, to think about when we want to try to equate Laura with Cal Key. And uh, we should remember what uh, Dale Cooper tells us. So when two things happen simultaneously pertaining to the same object of inquiry, we must pay special attention. And it's curious to me that um, we, we go to um, part 10 of the return and the title of part 10 is Laura is the one. And I would argue that here David Lynch is cleverly, deliberately encoding Laura's identity as the 10th avatar through the title of the 10th installment of The Return. Um, and that's basically what I have regarding Laura, my interpretation of how I, I look at Laura Palmer in the story. I think, I think if we look closely at Hindu concepts and beliefs, uh, we can gain a lot of insight into some of what Lynch is addressing in The Return. He overtly in incorporates this and other Hindu concepts uh, into the narrative. Um, Hindu cosmology helps clarify an ambiguous, sometimes contradictory narrative. And I think it provides a map of sorts to some tricky terrain. It, it may not be perfect, and it may not explain all the baffling elements that we see, but I think, at least in terms of Laura Palmer, perhaps, it points us uh, towards some revelation. And that's what I have. Wow. Uh, amazing stuff, as always there, John. Um, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions and discussion coming up um, at the end of our presentations. Um, so yeah, please put questions in the chat as we go along. Um, but now we have Carla Lonsha, um, who um, will be um, doing her um, presentation, The Perils of Looking Back, The Return and the Myth of Orpheus and Eurydice. Just to give you some background, Carla is a Croatian PhD candidate in film studies at the University of Zagreb in the Institute of Lexicography. The subject of her dissertation is Twin Peaks, for which she was awarded the Fulbright Research Scholarship in 2017-18. And her writing on this series has already appeared in various Croatian and international publications such as Supernatural Studies Journal, Desist Film, New American Notes Online, and 25 Years Later. So um, take it away, Carla. Thank you. Thank you for having me and hello to everyone. Okay, I'm going to start my presentation. Let's see. 
Okay. Throughout centuries, the ancient Greek myth of Orpheus and Eurydice has inspired myriad of artists and thinkers, David Lynch and Mark Frost included, who seem to be turning to it in Twin Peaks to return in a particularly complex and subversive manner. However, in order to illustrate how, firstly, I would like to remind everyone on various stories of Orpheus and Eurydice, as well as their connection to Twin Peaks. Orpheus was a legendary poet and a musician with extraordinary, even magical abilities. When he would sing and play his lyre, he even made animals, trees, and rocks move like enchanted. Among many things, he is also believed to be the prophet and founder of Orphic Mysteries, which is a religious sect that claimed there is an afterlife to men who spend their lives practicing asceticism, as well as performing rituals that invoke suffering and death. According to various sources, these prophecies were based on his visit to the underworld, which in many stories took place because he was trying to resurrect his wife Eurydice, who died of a snake bite. The most renowned version, uh, versions of this myth have been told by the Greek philosopher Plato and Roman poets Virgil and Ovid, out of which the part about Orpheus' descent into the underworld got particularly embedded into collective memory. Most of them tell a story of a grief-struck Orpheus who charmed the gods of the underworld into giving him back Eurydice under condition he doesn't look back at her until they both step into the upper world. However, he was too impatient to follow this through, so he looked back before she stepped into the light, which made her disappear forever. Embittered, Orpheus continued his life by playing beautiful music and rejecting women, eventually dying by the hands of female followers of the god Dionysus, the Menes, who dismembered him in their religious frenzy. According to Plato, the gods were never in favor of Orpheus in the first place because they found his actual unwillingness to die for love extremely cowardly, which is why they presented him the apparition of Eurydice in Hades and punished him by sending Menes to kill him. Out of the aforementioned authors, only Ovid says something more about Eurydice in the context of Orpheus' death. He wrote that Orpheus went back to the underworld, where he from then onwards has walked side by side with Eurydice without having to turn a backward look at her anymore. How does this myth translate to Twin Peaks? There are several parallels. At the very end of the second season, Dale Cooper, just like Orpheus, enters the Black Lodge, a version of the underworld, in order to bring back his girlfriend, Annie Blackburn, who was taken there by the psychopathic Wendham Earl. She doesn't literally die twice, though, as she gets released from the lodge, but she does end up in a somewhat trans state, particularly illustrated in the film Fire Walk With Me, and later suffering from some sort of catatonia, as suggested in Mark Frost's book, The Final Dossier. In a different manner, some sort of a double death does happen to Laura Palmer, whose lifeless body is narratively opening the whole series, since her uncanny lookalike cousin Maddie Ferguson dies by the hands of the same killers. Of course, the most striking mirroring of this myth occurs in the return, especially part 17 and 18. There we see Cooper trying to save Laura from her perilous situations in two different timelines. In the first, he's saving her from her death, only to lose her, screaming by an unknown force after he turned back to look at her. In the second, he or his supposed version, Richard, is taking Carrie Page or another version of Laura home to Twin Peaks, which provokes her to scream again with such force that he or they immediately get transported back to the Red Room. This connection is even more emphasized by the fact that the first scene from part 17 strikingly resembles the painting by Jean-Baptiste Camille Corot called Orpheus leading Eurydice from the Underworld. As you can see here, I think I missed one um, and I don't know how to get back. I'm sorry. Uh, okay, Mark Frost himself confirmed the reference to the Smith too on a few occasions by comparing Cooper with Orpheus and his hubris, that is his actions against the divine order. Twin Peaks scholars and fans connected the series with several other films thematically inspired by Orpheus. Very frequent is the comparison with Alfred Hitchcock's film Vertigo, which is considered a version of Orphic tragedy, since its male protagonist, Cody Ferguson, gets entangled with an actress, Judy, who is hired to fake death of an enchanting woman, Madeline, but later dies the same way. 
According to many, this plot echoes the fates of Maddie Ferguson, whose name is a direct reference to Vertigo's characters, and Laura Palmer or Carrie Page in the last two episodes of The Return. Some similarities can be found between The Return and Sidney Lumet's film adaptation of Tennessee Williams' play Orpheus Descending called The Fugitive Kind as well. In it, the leading male character, played by Marlon Brando nonetheless, reenacts Orpheus' tragic trajectory while wearing a snakeskin jacket, just like Cooper's evil doppelganger, Mr. C. However, Especially striking connections can be found between Twin Peaks and Jean Cocteau's dreamlike Orphic trilogy, which have been particularly pointed out by scholars Frank Bouleg and Robert Wolpert. The first film of the trilogy, the avant-garde The Blood of a Poet, depicts characters who continuously die or transform into something else, at which the most memorable is the figure of an artist who traverses the hotel-like other world situated behind a mirror. He was advised to do this by the ancient female statue, also shown at the end of the film near a lyre, which is Orpheus's instrument. In the second film, Orpheus, uh, based on Cocteau's eponymous theatrical adaptation of the myth, the protagonist, a poet called Orpheus, needs to resurrect his wife Eurydice from the underworld, interestingly called the Zone, where he's more mesmerized by the princess representing death than driven by the love for his wife. To access the underworld, oftentimes represented by a negative imagery and reverse motion photography and speech, he had to use mirrors, which were also placed in his bedroom, decorated with chevron patterned rug and floral wallpaper, as well as rubber gloves left by the princess herself due to, to their magical qualities. In the third film, This Testament of Orpheus, a film about film and Cocteau's body of work, Orpheus is equated with the otter. Uh, played by a director himself, who needs to repeatedly die in order to learn and create, most suitably in the medium of film, which he calls a petrifying source of thought that brings dead acts to life. In other words, an art form which easily transcends finitude and time. Considering this, the poet is able to travel through space-time, which he readily demonstrates, and at one point asks, what year is it, similarly to Cooper or Richard in part 18. Besides these, there are many more connections between Cocteau's Orphic films and especially The Return, proving that Cocteau's Orpheus was one of the major influences to Frost and Lynch, who as a follower of surrealist tendencies himself praised his work in 1987 BBC documentary on surrealist cinema. There is an undeniable thematic and formal mirroring between these works of art, the myth and Twin Peaks, especially The Return. However, I argue there is a more complex link than it at all, which can, all uh, which can be unraveled if we focus our attention on the relationship between Cooper, who takes on a role of Orpheus, and Laura, who embodies Eurydice, even though there is no romantic connection between them. Yes, Cooper, like Orpheus, is dreaming to save her. But unlike Eurydice, who stands on the whole thing is usually unknown, Laura doesn't seem eager to follow him in every aspect of their journey, which is why many scholars and critics have concluded he's suffering from the so-called white knight syndrome and problems with his masculinity, due to the fact he wasn't able to save not only Laura, but also Annie, Maddie, and his former lover Caroline, who appeared as a Black Lodge apparition in the season two finale. Indeed, Laura is not a silent shadow waiting to be returned to the underworld or upper world, depending on the perspective. She screams, objects, and keeps coming back, which is why I think that in order to grasp the meaning of Cooper and Laura's relation, it is one of the utmost importance to consult feminist and psychoanalytic readings on the stories about Orpheus and Eurydice. While studying the myths and doctrines surrounding Orpheus, many scholars have recognized their patriarchal aspects. For example, W.K.C. Guthrie argues that the stories about his later life, in which he excluded women as his audience and lovers in favor of men and boys, point out to, to his misogyny. Liz Locke too finds it interesting that earlier versions of the myth, if at all, named Eurydice Agriope, which means wild-eyed or wild-voiced, which suggests she was subjugated to Orpheus, whose music tamed animals, trees, and rocks, that is, old wildlife, all wildlife. That said, she also argues that it's quite indicative that Orpheism was an exclusively male religious sect, which is celebrated knowledge that, according to Orphic theogonies, is not birthed from bodies of women. Kaja Silverman, in her book dedicated to this myth, Flesh of My Flesh, identifies the problem in its further reception too. The first part of the myth, she says, has a firm hold on the Western imagination, 
As the myth journeyed through time, Eurydice's second death, death stopped mattering. What was important about Orpheus's backward look was the threat it posed to him. For many Christian-influenced thinkers, Orpheus was a Christ figure, and Eurydice symbolized the earthbound passions of the devil. Later, many, like Maurice Blanchot, saw Orpheus as a prototypical Coctuesque male artist, and Eurydice as the furthest, the most destructive point the art can reach, which positions, positions Eurydice, according to Nora E. Offen, who refers to Margaret Roselius and Judy Burnstock, in a role of a passive object in service to the ambivalent, ambivalent male artist. Having all, that in, uh, having all this said, Silverman isn't surprised why Ovid's coda, or the very last part of the story in which Orpheus gets killed and reunited with Eurydice in the afterlife, hasn't received that much attention. So, oh no, okay. Silverman traces it though in certain authors, out of which Lou Andrea Salome, Salome's psychoanalytic work is definitely worth mentioning here. In her work, the primary focus is on the power and not the perilous of looking back. To, to her, there is a redemptive quality in this kind of looking, uh, beginning of quote, the capacity to make the past happen again in a new way. She also suggests that transformations in a person's private past can precipitate changes in the historical past. When we, when we turn around and embrace the partner we have repudiated, Salome writes in her poor journal, all the vanished people on the past arise anew, end quote. Particularly interesting is Eurydice's position in arts and psychoanalytic theory of Graha Ettinger as well. As Judith Butler writes in the foreword of Ettinger's book, Eurydice is always beginning of a quote, already lost, already gone, already dead, and yet the moment in which our gaze apprehends her, she's there. She's coming toward us, she's fading away from us, and both are true at once, end quote. This specific presence within the absence invokes a unique spatiotemporal dimension of what Edinger calls the matrix or the matrixial, which equates with prenatal symbolic space or border space, where I and the unknown non-I coexist and transformative transferential potentialities emerge. It is accessible in post-Edipal world, especially through visual artwork, which urges us to relinquish the phallic gaze, which seeks to master, possess an object in favor of a matrixical one. To quote Rachel Dumas in her thought-provoking paper on Twin Peaks The Return. In this paper, she connects Edinger's theory and the myth of Orpheus and Eurydice to conclude, among other things, that return profoundly, beginning of quote, illuminates how trauma might find articulation through us on the condition that we become vulnerable to its affects, end quote. Just like Cooper seems to do at the very end of the series when he is left alone again with Laura in the border space of the Red Room. If we follow what has been said about the myth, Twin Peaks Return can indeed be read, among other things, as Cooper's Orphic journey, but the one resembling, Ovid, resembling Ovid's version of the story, where Orpheus and Eurydice begin their trajectory in an unequal manner, but end up more equal than ever. In other words, an allegorical journey that cleverly deconstructs and subverts Cooper's struggles with problematic notions of gender relations and identity. While managing his struggles, Cooper, similarly to Cocteau's Orpheus, experiments with death, time, and his own wounded psyche, personified in several versions of his. In the beginning, he's all about making himself whole again after separating from his season two shadow self, Mr. C. Interestingly, his doppelganger is a killer and rapist of women who wears a jacket made of skins of snakes, which, as we remember, killed Eurydice in the first place. After Cooper succeeds in unifying himself, he's still on a mission to lead and dominate, though, as one can see in the scenes with Laura and or Carrie in the last two parts. Sometimes he's even grabbing their arm, especially in part 18. These scenes incredibly remind of the ones from Vertigo, which feminist scholars, as explored by Susan White, oftentimes describe as a film about patriarchal fantasies of women who are expected to feel an immense phallic lack or to be punished for exposing it. However, while taking Laura's version or Carrie home, something groundbreaking happens. Unlike Hitchcock's women and even her part 17 younger self, this Laura demonstrates an immense amount of agency and power. Yes, in the last two parts, she metaphorically dies twice, but the second time she and Cooper disappear soon after the sequence ends, thanks to her powerful and blackout-inducing scream, 
compared with the atomic explosion of the part eight. Many renditions of the myth stop mentioning Eurydice when Orpheus fails to take her to the upper world home. If not, her function is still to remain a doomed object, an unfortunate loss that is required for Orpheus's work to become immortal. That is not the case with part 18 Laura, whose spirit is to be seen again in the next and the very last shot of the series. Standing side by side with Cooper in the red room and whispering what we know is the name of her killer into his ear. In season three, the scene is a repetition of almost the same scene in part two, where Red, Lo where red Room Laura can be seen whispering into Dale's ear, after which she also screamingly disappears, foreshadowing the events of the last two parts. Contrastingly, the last show of the season doesn't depict Laura screaming whilst being taken by some unknown force. Viewers can only see her whispering, accompanied by a very toned down background music. What this final scene suggests is that Cooper might have finally started listening to what she has to say without the distractions of the skipping gramophone sounds the firemen warned him about at the beginning of the season. Or that Cooper finally learned to embrace, not master, the ever-shifting Laura and the feminine she represents, as well as her own and other women's traumas within the realm of the Red Room border space which induces continuous cycles of deaths and rebirths in between which he, together with her, just might make past happen, as Elena would say, in a new way. This is the literature I used. Um, so here you can see, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Carla. Again, wonderful stuff. I get blow on my mind here, people. All right, um, we've got our final uh, paper for today. Um, we've got Ethan Warren. So Ethan is a senior editor for the online film journal Bright Wall Dark Room, and he's currently writing his first book, The Cinema of Paul Thomas Anderson, under contract with Columbia University Press. So Ethan is here uh, to um, take us through his paper called It's a Strange Carnival, Tensions Between Camusian and Nagelian Absurdity, in Twin Peaks, The Return. So Ethan, when you're ready. All right, thank you. Um, let's see here, bear with me. I have never actually done this before um, in terms of presenting something here. Uh, does that, that work for everybody? Yeah. All right. Um, so first off, I just wanted to uh, thank the organizers uh, for having me here. Um, following John is uh, incredibly intimidating, but uh, it's also an honor, um, Carla, you as well. Uh, and before I begin, I, I also just want to note that this talk uh, does include discussions of suicide, um, including philosophical theories on a rationale behind that choice. So if anyone watching is vulnerable to that kind of discussion, um, I just wanted to make sure and include that warning. Uh, with that said, uh, so towards the end of uh, part three of Twin Peaks The Return, uh, the FBI's Blue Rose Task Force receives word that the uh, long missing uh, Special Agent Dale Cooper has reappeared in a South Dakota prison. And as they process this news, uh, Agent Albert Rosenfield grumbles nine uh, very significant words, the absurd mystery of the strange forces of existence. And uh, that absurd mystery is a uniting force across uh, the entirety of Lynch's career. Uh, as he told Gary Indiana in 1980, I love absurdity, you know. Uh, and as he told Christine McKenna in 1989, absurdity is what I like most in life. Now, obviously, uh, the term absurd has a colloquial definition. Uh, it's usually something that is so shockingly outrageous that you kind of can't help but laugh. And that can be easily applied to much of Lynch's work. Uh, but the term absurd also uh, does have two significant uh, theoretical definitions. One of them is aesthetic and the other is philosophical. And both of those definitions have significant resonance with Lynch's work. And it can help contextualize some of the more uh, confounding elements of his storytelling. So to tackle the aesthetic definition first, uh, I am referring here to absurdism, particularly theater of the absurd, which is a term that was coined by the theater critic Martin Eslin in 1960 with his book of the same name. Um, in this book on absurdism, uh, Eslin identified five post-war playwrights, including uh, Samuel Beckett, Harold Pinter, Eugene Ionesco, uh, all of whose works are absurdist. And when Eslin describes the absurd in these works, He's not necessarily referring to humorous situations. Uh, he's talking about situations that are unreasonable and illogical. Um, the absurdists 
uh, according to Eslin, have identified uh, this common feeling of disillusionment in their post-war era, which is a sense that you know life may actually be nonsensical and uh, existence may be pointless. And then rather than try to make sense of this feeling, they dramatize nonsense. They depict the world as absurdly irrational. Uh, and these plays are, are often funny, but they are uh, just as often uh, unnerving and, and uh, even terrifying. <laughs> so, Among Eslin's criteria for absurdist work, there are two factors that are prominent in Lynch's work. Uh, the first is a radical devaluation of language, and the second is an abandonment of realistic characterization in favor of characters who behave more like mechanical puppets uh, in a manner that reflects dream logic. So to start with the radical devaluation of language uh, that is at play in, in much of Lynch's work, uh, it's always, um, his stuff is often dense with nonsense and non sequitur. Uh, but in the return, uh, language is most powerfully devalued in the Woodman's radio broadcast, which takes a very much absurdist approach to language. Uh, you know, he's giving some kind of incantation. There is a clear unnerving power to these words, uh, but they only barely hang together by any kind of standard of logic. As Eslin says, in absurdism, the poetry of the story has to emerge from the concrete objectified images because the words are not doing their traditional work, which resonates uh, very much with Lynch's own preference to use language like a painter does, uh, like a painter uses shapes and textures rather, uh, without regard for traditional logic, which is very much an absurdist approach to language. And as for characters who behave like mechanical puppets that operate on dream logic, again, this operates, uh, this represents a huge number of Lynchian characters. Uh, but in Twin Peaks, The Return, I have, I've always found the conversations between Audrey and Charlie to be very much aligned with the theater of the absurd, um, particularly something like Waiting for Godot, uh, where Charlie and Audrey seem to be playing out some kind of simulacrum of a conversation. Their behaviors have an eerie robotic quality that strips away the logic from the social custom of negotiating plans. And pretty soon the idea of leaving for the roadhouse becomes as absurdly impossible as the idea of Godot ever arriving. Um, it is a pursuit that consumes all of your energy while being completely futile, much like our efforts in a dream. So if we can agree that uh, and Peaks the Return is a work that fits pretty well within the parameters of Theater of the Absurd. Um, it is then worth, I think, turning to the philosophical roots of Eslin's theories, which have their own resonance with Lynch's work. Uh, Eslin's theory of theatrical absurdism was an outgrowth of a 1942 essay. Well, if there's a discrepancy between my slide and my paper, then, uh, you know, can't, can't attest to that. Uh, an essay by Albert Camus entitled uh, The Myth of Sisyphus. Uh, Camus posits that we, uh, as humans, are constantly nagged by the suspicion that life might be meaningless. Um, it might not operate according to any system of logic that we can comprehend, uh, and then this would make all of our daily behaviors uh, sort of unnecessary and ridiculous. Um, at the moment when we feel the universe suddenly divested of illusions, uh, we experience a sense of divorce between man and his life, which triggers an existential cognitive dissonance that we call absurdity. This can often be triggered by a sudden perception of the natural world as dense and complex, uh, which is a, a moment of seeing the world as a place of primitive hostility. All of these quotes are Camus from that essay. Uh, so when we are divested of the illusion that the world is comprehensible and life may have meaning, uh, we are likely to see all of our daily efforts as pointless, uh, much like Sisyphus endlessly pushing his boulder. So to suppress this cognitive dissonance and, and keep ourselves from uh, accepting despair and ending our lives, we have to meet the hostile and meaningless world with scorn and maintain the implacable nobility uh, that is necessary to keep living a possibly meaningless life. Uh, now in 1979, the philosopher Thomas Nagel wrote his own essay on life's absurdity and, and he overlaps with Camus in some key ways and then pushes back against him and others. Uh, Nagel agrees that most people on occasion uh, feel that life is absurd and our daily efforts may be meaningless. What distinguishes Nagel's theory from Camus is that where Camus sees absurdity as a collision between our experiences and the world, Nagel sees absurdity as a collision within ourselves. If we imagine the world as a place of hostility, that means that the world could potentially offer meaning if things were different, which Nagel believes is an illogical argument. So instead, what we're dealing with is the cognitive dissonance of justifying our behaviors to ourselves. 
which means trying to simultaneously exist in the world and then objectively gauge our own significance, which uh, is probably an illusory standard anyway. And then the anxious self-consciousness of that attempt triggers a feeling we call absurdity. Uh, Nagel talks about how a mouse cannot experience life's absurdity because it lacks the capacity for self-consciousness. And so as humans, the only way that we could avoid absurd self-consciousness would be to either never attain it or forget it, neither of which we could achieve deliberately. As Nagel describes it, uh, Camus believes that we can salvage our dignity by shaking a fist at the world, whereas Nagel believes this perspective is, quote, romantic and slightly self-pitying because uh, our absurdity warrants neither that much distress nor that much defiance. Uh, absurdity is really just a testament to the power of human consciousness. And so it need not be a matter for agony unless we make it so. Now we can see both Camus' perspective and Nagel's uh, expressed in Twin Peaks, The Return. Uh, to begin with Camus' theory that we might see life as absurd if we caught a glimpse of the world as a place of untamed chaos. Uh, I find the way that Lynch shoots the natural world in Twin Peaks to be very significant. Um, if you think about other horror movies and series that are concerned with something's out there in the woods, uh, you look at Evil Dead uh, by Sam Raimi, uh, you see a lot of stylization in the camera work and this, the sound design is, is suggesting some inhuman evil force through exaggerated film grammar. But as far back as the pilot episode, Lynch uh, tends to eschew that kind of stylization. He likes to show the natural world with a very neutral eye, very long, wide shots, very deep focus, flat lighting. Uh, he tends to show us this supernatural forest without any of the aesthetic tricks that uh, we tend to associate with heightened terror. And so by taking that neutral perspective, at least according to Camus' argument, Lynch triggers an absurd form of terror. He divests us of the illusion that the horror in this series is going to be familiar and manageable. And then he even heightens that defamiliarization in the return by stripping away, uh, for the most part, Angelo Badalamenti's moody score, which is sort of the last aesthetic guardrail that keeps those wide shots of the natural world from suggesting uh, the complete irrational void that they do in uh, the third season. Obviously, the world of Twin Peaks does have an organizing spiritual force. There is a network of supernaturally powerful beings here. So you can't say that this is a world that is completely devoid of any organizing order. But both Camus and Nagel do argue that even if there is an organizing force behind the universe, if we can't understand it, if we can't wrap our heads around it, it's not gonna do any good in alleviating absurd dread. And it might even heighten the absurdity by turning us into the equivalent of insects who are just kind of bumbling around under this higher plane of consciousness. And again, I think Lynch does fascinating work in the return, uh, heightening the absurd unknowability of the Twin Peaks cosmology. Um, you know, by the midst of the second season, we're, we're making big strides towards maybe having some grasp on how the spiritual world of this Twin Peaks universe might work. And that might provide some comfort. Um, it offers some structure to the absurd chaos of this world. And in the return, Lynch does not necessarily undo that work, uh, but he does layer on this dizzying amount of new iconography. Uh, you know, the, the Ashton Woodsman, the giant talking tea kettles, the mansion on the Purple Sea, none of this can really be touched by the explanations that are offered in the original series, largely not really hinted at in uh, Mark Frost's secret history. And once again, as Camus might say, Lynch is divesting, of us our, divesting us of our illusion of comprehension. He is alienating us from this fictional universe, which creates a very Camusian absurdity. As for the Nigelian perspective, uh, that absurdity arises from our suspicion that our lives might seem pointless in the abstract, uh, which is sort of the effect that Lynch and Frost conjure with the running thread of the roadhouse patrons who appear towards the end of so many episodes. Uh, we are just kind of dropped into these melodramas as observers. We have no investment in these characters and the things that they are talking about uh, that are so passionate for them can very easily seem ridiculous to the point of kind of absurdist illogic to us as the outside observer. Uh, and so Lynch and Frost are, it seems to me, sort of inviting us to consider how inane our own uh, dramatic lives might sound if we were being observed by a neutral third party, uh, which is very likely to trigger uh, Nigelian absurdity. Then there are two sequences in part 11 of the series uh, that both explore the absurd cognitive dissonance of being pushed outside our own perspective. And by the series, I do mean uh, season three, The Return. Um, 
deals with us being pushed outside our own perspective and forced to reckon with how disconnected our perceptions of our own lives might be uh, from some broader context. They take very different approaches and they have very different effects. So in the first sequence, the Blue Rose Task Force visits the gateway to the zone. And Gordon Cole has this uh, overwhelming encounter with some cosmic force, which we are initially uh, experiencing from very close to his perspective. The entire thing feels as powerful to us as it does to him. We then shift outside the perspective uh, to the perspective of the other characters. We can't access the significance of Gordon's experience, though it appears illogical, halfway absurd. And then we're also uh, shifting even further out to this entirely distant perspective. And then Gordon looks like an ant waving his antenna around. So again, something that is intensely significant to one character can look from the outside uh, as pathetic as the efforts of an insect, which is the essence of Miguelian absurd anxiety. Later in that episode, uh, after Bobby and Shelley have their heart to heart with Becky, uh, Bobby watches his ex, the love of his life, leave with another man. And he has this intense moment of personal emotion. And that experience is interrupted by a shocking eruption of violence outside. Bobby is pulled out of his immediate perspective and into this drama that he has to struggle to comprehend. This, a kid has gotten a hold of a gun. There's this whole chaotic context that he is alienated from. And it, it, it comes across as halfway surreal. He's then pulled even further into this world of illogic when he goes to deal with the screaming, honking woman and her sick child, which is about as absurdist a vignette as Lynch has ever given us. Uh, Bobby is being gradually divorced from any recognizable logic and forced into a space of Lynchian absurdism, which very nicely blends the Camusian and Nigelian perspectives. He is confronted with the world's disorder and the vehicle for that confrontation is a reminder of his own limited perspective. Now, if this series is demonstrating that Twin Peaks uh, operates on principles that apply to both uh, Nagel's and Camus' perspectives, then uh, you know, I find myself wondering which perspective do they ultimately align with? Uh, do Lynch and Frost believe that we could salvage our dignity by shaking our fists at the world? Or do we take this opportunity to understand our human limitations and bypass agony, as Nagel would recommend? I think uh, that the answer kind of lies in the distinction between uh, Dougie Cooper and Special Agent Dale Cooper. Uh, Dougie Cooper is the embodiment of Nagel's theoretical anti-absurd human. He has forgotten the ability to be self-conscious. He has no observing eye. He's just pursuing impulses, shuffling around, enjoying coffee. Um, he is the mouse that has been freed of the burden of self-conscious angst, as, as Nagel would have it. Um, and what is the result? He makes the world around him a demonstrably better place. He enables the people that he encounters to achieve peace and satisfaction. He facilitates their redemption. But the moment that he is returned to his full capacity as Special Agent Dale Cooper, he immediately uh, sets about pursuing solutions to the problems of a world that we have now seen operates on pretty close to pure absurd illogic. And what is the result of his attempt to fix the world of Twin Peaks? He moves himself and everyone else as far as possible into a realm of absurd alienation. He completely divorces himself and uh, Carrie or Lara, as, as you would have it, from their illusion of logic and order. By shaking his fist in defiance of absurdity, he has done nothing but amplify it. As Nagel says, our absurd condition does not need to be a matter of agony unless we make that choice. And so while none of us would probably want to emulate Dougie Cooper, uh, he does serve as an extreme example of the good that can come from relinquishing romantic self-pity, as Nagel puts it, uh, of the defiant perspective. Uh, now, one essential factor in absurdist theory that I did want to briefly touch on is the socio-political framework of Eslin's uh, writing, where he believed that absurdist storytelling uh, emerged in response to the atrocities of World War II. As Eslin wrote, uh, quote, the certitudes and unshakable basic assumptions of former ages have been swept away, end quote, uh, by the horrors of the Holocaust and the atomic bomb. The only way that storytellers can reckon with this feeling of a completely unreasonable world is to tell stories that operate on illogic. And so what I see in the return is a, a sort of a 21st century extension of Estlin's theory. Um, you know, the, the series plants its roots in the incomprehensible evil of the atomic bomb. And then rather than kind of rest on that original sin, uh, the series follows the thread through the fallout of the Bush years, the failures of the Obama promise, the dawning horrors of the Trump era. We have Frank Truman's son, uh, so traumatized by the meaningless war in Iraq that he has succumbed to suicide. 
uh, the fat trout residents who go to the absurd length of selling their own blood just so they can afford to survive. And through it all, we have Dr. Jacoby's routine as a conspiracy theorist scammer in the Alex Jones mold. And so if absurdist storytelling is an exaggeration of uh, unreasonable socio-political conditions, uh, then Twin Peaks The Return shows us that by 2017, there's not a lot of uh, exaggeration necessary to tip the American condition towards Lynchian absurdity. But for as, as much as I've talked here about existential dread and anxiety and despair, um, it should not go unsaid that, that this is a season of TV that is filled with comedy and beauty and pleasure. And this in itself is an embodiment of a particularly Lynchian form of absurdism. Um, in 1997, Lynch told David Breskin, in life there is suffering and darkness and confusion and absurdities, it's fantastic. It's like a strange carnival. It's a lot of fun, but it's a lot of pain. And if there's any ultimate message to this particular portrait of life's absurdity, uh, it is that the, the fun and the pain can go hand in hand, and there's no need to focus on one at the exclusion of the other. We're not going to solve the absurd mystery of the strange forces of existence anytime soon. And so in the meantime, we may as well just buy our ticket and try to uh, enjoy the strange carnival. Thank you. Okay. Wow. Thank you so much for that, Ethan. Um, some so a, a note uh, ending on a note that seems somewhat optimistic, I guess, which um, uh, was something that I, I kind of always strikes me this idea about mythology and that mythology, you know, is something that's been around since humanity began and these populations that don't know each other, the, the same archetypes come up again and again. So we've had Eastern mythology and Western mythology and that there's always these connections that can be made. Um, <clears throat> all right, I was wondering if we have any questions at all to go in the chat, if people on Zoom want to put their hands up, if they want to ask a question or um, anyone on YouTube. Um, all right. Just on YouTube, there's a little delay, but I'll let you know if something comes up there. Okay. All right. Uh, so just... I'll just kick things off then. So, I mean, I did also note an element of optimism in your um, paper, John, about this whole idea that it's the end, bringing an end to this dark age. Um, I just want, um, I'm just wondering, um, Carla as well, do you, you have also mentioned this idea of um, the power of looking back. So, yeah. Um, so this idea, so for you and the, the ending of the series, is there still for you this, note of optimism or positivity or yeah. definitely I've always seen it like this it's not so apparent like in firewalk with me uh, for example because um firewalk with me and uh, you know season three and practically in a similar way we see like in firewalk with me we see Laura standing I mean sitting um next to Cooper and you know smiling meeting her transcendence or whatever um, and uh, in season three, we see them both together um, at, you know, at the same time in this like toned down atmosphere. But OK, Cooper is looking a little bit anxious. I think he has, uh, you know, lots to learn and, you know, evolve more. But I think he's on a good path, I think. Um, unlike Laura, I mean, she with her, you know, tears and, and smiling and firework with me, I think that um, it's a little bit more pessimistic, but all in all, it's it's a good ending. Mm. And, and Ethan, you, your, your final quote there, I mean, it reminds me that, yeah, I think Lynch often is talking about this idea of balance. And so, yeah, that, that you always have to maintain this balance in, I guess, in life, but also in his approaches um, I, I'm just wondering if that was something that you kind of have thought of in, in your approach as well, this idea of balance between or yeah, like, you know, the comedy or, uh, as well as the despair. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, you know, David Lynch has spent the past, God, like 50 years just giving us incredible quotes. And so I'm trying to summon anything uh, great pointing to that. I can't off the top of my head. Um, but I do, I think that um, so much of, of particularly absurdity, which is, is you know, my fascination uh, with his stuff, is so much about um, the cognitive dissonance of, uh, you know, trying to experience both kind of comedy and horror in the same moment. Um, and uh, 
that is, you know, it's a lot of fun, but it's a lot of pain is, is sort of the guiding ethos of uh, so much of his work, um, you know, with the, the balance shifting throughout. Um, I actually, I, I um, first wrote about uh, Lynch and absurdism um, just prior to the return. And I found the ending of Fire Walk With Me to be um, almost a spoiler in my, uh, my theories because it ends with the appearance of that angel and the suggestion uh, that that Lara's, uh, you know, life um, and the death uh, do do kind of fall within some recognizable spiritual framework, and so uh, I just so appreciated him in the return. Like I said, throwing in all of this uh, completely incongruous imagery that you can't fit into the uh, framework because that allows Twin Peaks to to fit a little bit better within my uh, framework. Yeah, um, we have a question from Simon. You should unmute. Um, I think, um, can you hear me? Yep. Um, the, this is for John. Um, thank you for having somebody else, um, somebody else liking the absurd in the world of David Lynch. Um, and thank you to everybody. Actually, they were all fantastic talks. Loved them all. Um, I'm kind of interested in your kind of take on Camus as kind of slightly more negative because I've always seen his one has to be with friends and swim in the warm waters. Mediterranean is a very potter, sorry, at four in the morning here and I'm a bit incoherent, um, as being a very positive thing. He's, as far as I can see, it's not about saying the world is against you or literally being a rebel. It's like going, it's there, I'm just going to move through it and 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 take it on in a positive way. Um, and for me, Cooper at the end of a return is like Sisyphus waking up to that realization and then moving on. And Dougie is almost like the person who was having the coffee, who was being with his friends, who's enjoying love in the world for what it is. So I'm kind of interested in that relationship between Nagel and Camus. And I'm kind of interested in your, uh, you didn't mention Kierkegaard, um, who I kind of think is kind of relevant considering that, again, what John was talking about, because he puts, he creates a God when he believes it can't be a God because he can't live without one. And again, Lynch's work seems to work in that frame where you're balancing an absurdist understanding of the universe, but also there's this theistic um, kind of framing of it to create meaning at the same time. So he's kind of relevant at the same time. And again, with Sisyphus, we have this link again to Orpheus, who's trying to escape death and gets punished for the gods for the same reason. Um, is I've probably thrown a lot at you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, and actually, that could be open for all of you. Actually, I'm kind of interested to think about those kind of relationships within absurdism and also, again, to the myths themselves that kind of frame some of it. Actually, uh, the Abrahamic myth as well. Sorry. Oh, sorry about the long, drawn-out question. That, that's awesome. Um, I... Just, just to speak specifically to my stuff first, um, I, I definitely, um, I think I kind of nudged the Camus argument in a certain direction to um, sort of set up the, uh, the distinction between him and Nagel as much as possible because Nagel uh, kind of goes at Camus in that uh, quote about how his, his points are uh, melodramatic and self-pitying and, and romantic. Um, and as, as other people have written about, Camus and Nagel probably have more in common than Nagel uh, wanted to believe. And I did just, you know, for the sake of the 20 minutes of it, I'll just kind of have to stick to these two guys. Um, partially because I just, I find Nagel's uh, irritation with Camus very amusing. Um, but yeah, Camus, he's, one of his uh, big lines is, one must imagine Sisyphus happy. So he does, he focuses very much on the idea that uh, the Sisyphean task can become uh, a source of, of meaning and, and pleasure and joy if, um, you know, he basically says, at the end of every cycle, Camus has, or uh, Sisyphus has to um, summon the energy to push the rock up. And so that is, is him kind of reckoning with uh, the potential sort of um, 
meaninglessness of life, if you will, uh, and uh, finding his own serenity within that. So it's it's all a lot more complex than I could get into in 20 minutes, uh, even talking really fast. But uh, I think it's really something that you could keep digging into a lot. And I, I want to try and bring the Kierkegaard element into it for sure. Hi, John, do you have hey. any response? Well, um, I think my fellow panelists are are better schooled in some of these theories than I. Um, I like to look at things narratively as best as much as I can. Um, I, you know, just you mentioned uh, the fireman as a god um, potentially. I mean, that's one way of reading it. Um, I I do map that character to the Hindu deity Vishnu. But, you know, Lynch has in other works sort of hinted at the idea that there are larger forces at work. Um, um, and he does that even as, you know, in Eraserhead. He, uh, and a panelist yesterday talked about this, but uh, Eraserhead opens with this man in the planet, and the man in the planet is pulling levers. And so, um, so you know, I, I'm not sure Lynch, where Lynch comes down on the idea of how much you know, uh, control man has over his, uh, his fate and whether or not there is this fi a larger figure uh, at, um, and, you know, in working things. And I, I actually think um, this gets sort of off topic. I don't want to get too far off topic, but I think the fireman's frustration to some extent is that Cooper does seem to try to push himself into his own. He wants to do his own thing. Cooper does. And, uh, it, um, it, you know, the fireman's got a plan and the fireman at a certain point is like, I got to get Andy to help me now because um, <laughs> Cooper's not, is uh, not cooperating. But, um, um, uh, but they, I mean, that's way off topic. I mean, getting to the idea of, of whether or not there's a, a godlike figure. Um, I think, um, I, I think Lynch was, you know, again, bringing it really narrow, narrowing it way down to Laura. I think he wanted to expand Laura's role in the story, and and the the, the Hindu philosophy um, was a, a way of for him to allow that that grander role for her in the story. I'm not sure that answers the question you want, but but anyway, that's my thoughts. All right, we have another question for you, John. Um, in addition to the appearances of the white horse in the return that you covered, we obviously also see a white horse in episode 14 and Fire Walk With Me. If you interpret the white horse as a harbinger of the end of the cycle of the Dark Age and the coming of Kalki, then how do you explain the horse's appearance at those earlier times, seemingly far away from whatever end is signified by the end of part 18? I expected to get this question. Um, and actually in the paper that I wrote, I, I go into some detail about the horse, uh, the white horse. Um, and, you know, the white horse, when it was first introduced in the original series, um, you know, it's hard to say exactly, you know, why Lynch put it there. Um, uh, Mark Frost comments on the fact that Lynch was fascinated with a certain film that depicted the slaughter of a white horse. I will mangle the name if I try to say it, so I'm not going to. Uh, and but he was he was fascinated with just simply with the imagery of the white horse, and so he wanted. And that's how Lynch is. He's a, he's an instinctual filmmaker, and he wanted to put a white horse in there. Um, and then Frost, after that, assigns the idea that a white horse represents death, death rides a pale horse. And so uh, that became without, you know, any, either of the creators specifically saying that's what the white horse was, that sort of became the idea. Um, you know, the Sarah Palmer, the, the white horse was associated with Sarah Palmer, essentially. She's the one who's, who saw it. And my argument would be, and maybe this is a cop out, but my argument would be that the white horse imagery was there in the narrative and Lynch found a way to repurpose it. And essentially, he was like, I've got it. Um, it's sort of ill-defined anyway. Um, and now I'm going to take it because it fits with this new idea. And again, as he comes back again and again to Laura, he's changing her, her role in the story. So he has this imagery that works for him. And I, I may be mistaken, but I don't think there's a white horse imagery in or horse imagery in The Return that's not connected to Laura. So he's he's deliberately connecting it now to Laura. Um, and I just think that kind of fit together for him. Yeah. Um, yeah, just to, we, we had both, uh, yeah, Frank just mentioned that, yeah, the, the film you met, um, the film about the, the slaughter of the horses is, mm -hmm. um, it's known, known as The Blood of the Beasts by Georges Franjou. 
Um, yes, that's it. Yeah. Yep. And yeah. Mark Frost, uh, Mark Frost mentions that specifically in the conversation with Mark Frost. Yeah. Um, all right. I'm just seeing if we've got any other questions. I mean, there is another comment here about the White Horse. It says, yeah, uh, the, it appears in Firewalk With Me in season two as a harbinger of Bob's murders and in season three as Cooper is leaving or being expelled from the lodge. So maybe the ends of smaller narratives within the larger cycle. Every interpretation of Twin Peaks is correct. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, to see if we've got any other, yep. Um, I mean, it's just interesting they're mentioning the reference to, to Franju, um, and which also, I mean, working around the same time, you have Cocteau. Um, I mean, uh, to, to Carla, I was just wondering, like, um, as you were watching The Return, um, was there certain points where Cocteau was coming to your mind or how you kind of came to, to making those connections? Well, I remember that, I mean, Cocteau made Orphic Trilogy and I watched some of his films before. And of course, like um, his motives like rang a bell, but um, I haven't seen his films up until recently um, uh, when I started researching for this paper and presentation. And I was just blown away how many, many reference there is in, in you know, Lynch and Frost's work and not only their work, but also Lynch's work and also many, many, you know, um, uh, modernist films and like films by, I don't know, like any director who has some kind of like artistic aspiration. So um, yeah, I want to actually add on um, the, uh, the, the questions with horses. I mean, um, in Cocteau's films that, I mean, horses play a part as well. I mean, uh, they are black actually, they're not white, but you know, like people, like certain heartbringers, heartbringers of death have um, like, huge huge mass of horses and at one point I remember in Twin Peaks like season two Wyndham Earl actually had a mask of horse um it was um I don't know it wasn't white I think it had like little dots or something but uh it, it I think they played with this motif of like horses of death or whatever it is so that's interesting but yeah Cocteau I think it's, it's a huge influence and I, I I'm like saying you, I'm telling you that like you should all watch this trilogy because it's just mind blowing how similar is it is to Twin Peaks. All right. Um, we have a question from Matt Holterman, if he's there. Yep, I'm here. Um, I really loved that panel and everything going on in it. And I just wanted to ask a broad question about Twin Peaks and mythology, because on the one hand, it's fascinating to see how many cultural mythologies we can find and then map Twin Peaks onto them. But I've also noticed in the Twin Peaks community, more than many other communities of interpretation that I'm in, that we're myth-making as a group. It's just captivating to me, right? There's a whole reliquary, reliquary behind me of all the Twin Peaks artifacts that I've collected over the years, all the ways in which I've engaged, you know, all the ways in which my own path as a philosopher and as a person intersect with the characters. And more than any other show I've engaged, there's a sort of quasi spiritual, almost religious <laughs> element uh, to the way that uh, people who really go for this show interpret it. And so I wonder, you know, if you have anything to say about Twin Peaks as a kind of secular or personal myth-making device, right? Where we almost have a new vehicle here for reinventing some of these old narratives that we've been working with uh, for millennia. And it just seems like to have an, an, an incredible amount of potential for that. Um, and uh, I wondered what the panelists and anyone else uh, thought about that or if you've observed that also. Thank you. I, I, I can only say that, that uh, this is only like the most sort of sideways of answers, but uh, I, a, a quote that just popped into my head is, uh, 
when Lynch talked about liking uh, works, um, including I think maybe even uh, Cocteau, uh, maybe Orpheus, uh, he, he loves movies and, and uh, stories that make him dream for a week afterwards. And, uh, you know, I, I think uh, for better or worse, um, this, this uh, conference really reminds me a lot of the documentary, uh, is it Room 237? Um, the one about all the ways that people have, have interpreted The Shining. Um, I, wrote, I wrote an article about a year ago uh, about the kind of daisy chain of influence between uh, Eraserhead, The Shining, and Sunset Boulevard, um, which all of which are sort of tangled up together in, in uh, you know, having influenced each other in some regard. And um, both, you know, The Shining and, and Twin Peaks and so much of Lynch's work clearly are just so expansive uh, that you can just sort of, like you say, live within them and myth make, and it doesn't violate the uh, sort of parameters of the world to just sort of find this much uh, room for interpretation in them. And so uh, I don't know a lot about myth making, so I can't answer this on, on that level, but um, it is just such a wonderful work in that respect uh, where, you know, Lynch likes works that make him dream and he is able to create them too. So I think that's pretty cool. I, yeah, I'll, I'll just uh, briefly reply. I think it, it, it's a really fascinating question. It, it's really interesting to me. It makes me think, you know, the original series was filled with all these sort of pop cultural references or references to movies like Laura and Waldo the Minor Bird and all these things were uh, from Hitchcock. And um, we still see uh, some of that in The Return for sure. Although it's as if a Lynch and Frost sort of um, got a little more grounded in terms of they, they wanted to, to reach bigger for the influences. And so we see Orpheus and we see the Odyssey, which Frost has uh, uh, explicitly said, you know, Odessa, Texas, and the idea of Odyssey and a character going home after a long journey. Um, those are influences um, on, uh, on the new, on Twin Peaks, The Return. And then <clears throat> Lynch is bringing in some of the things that influenced him that were he returning to things that he's he's done in his past work but he's also bringing in um things that were very important to him um influenced his art uh i just mentioned very quickly kafka is is one for sure that um is such a strong influence on the return um i digging through a lot of kafka i actually found a diary entry a kafka writes about a white horse which was just amazing the idea of this white horse coming to life and jumping across a bed um and I don't know if Lynch saw that, but I know that Lynch read The Metamorphosis and I know that Lynch, um, I'm almost positive, read The Trial and, and those works influenced him. So they were, they were um, still pop cultural references, but then they were, I think, going into works that have stood, really stood the test of time. In some cases, you know, many, many centuries, the test of time. Uh, and they are incorporating that. And that's what I think Twin Peaks is such a rich, rich work. You can mine it for so much. You can find so many things in it. And, um, and, and it's a delight to, to see how these things play out and how they influence what is, in fact, um, its own unique original work. Um, despite all the influences, Twin Peaks is in and of itself unique. I mean, that leads on very well to a question from Andreas. Hi, Andreas, if you're out there. Um, who asks the question whether we, whether you all think Fr Frost and Lynch are mostly playing around with and, and eclectically using different elements in Twin Peaks The Return, or is there actually one coherent mythos behind it? I'm not, I, I guess I'm not quite sure um, whether I mean, the, the, uh, the variety of influence is obviously so eclectic um, is, is the question, I guess, um, whether they are using those to create a unified mythos or whether the question is, is there sort of one great unifying um, interpretive key? Um, I think there's, there's certainly probably not one great unifying interpretive key uh, or we probably wouldn't be able to get three days out of this. Um, I don't know. Yeah, in a way, I mean, I think obviously they conceive the return as some sort of um, upside down hero's quest or like subverted hero's quest uh, because the return is so much focused on Cooper, although of course there are lots of other characters. 
But yeah, I wouldn't say that there's just one mythos, but a um, variety of other mythologies um, that, you know, contributed to this, you know, Brand Cooper's coming back home or like Nostos that um, kind of went awry, I guess. I also, I think you can see so much influence of uh, dream logic on Lynch's, uh, Lynch's work um, and Froth, I never want to sort of uh, discount him in, in talking about Twin Peaks. Um, but he's, you know, he's, he's got so much resemblance with the surrealist, uh, which is so much of a kind of automatic writing. And um, I think to, to suggest that you can um, just sort of boil Twin Peaks to return down to uh, a unified mythos um, Sort of makes it, um, you know, sort of shrinks and constricts the uh, parameters of, of what you can get out of this work that is um, so very much a feeling of, of somebody dreaming in real time. I guess in, in some ways you can kind of say, yes, it is all one, or it's many things, and there's all connections. Um, the question from YouTube. Um, I read about season three that it mirrors through Dougie our role as spectators. Wouldn't you, and it's, it seems to be directed to Ethan, say that our work as spectators is in many ways absurd then because we just can't get it all like doggy? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, that is that is kind of like Nagel's point, which is like, you're, you're never really gonna be able to push outside your own perspective. You're always gonna be limited. And so no matter how much you want to obtain some uh, grand unified vision on your own significance, um, it's probably not, not not going to happen for you. Um, and something that is that is so great about Dougie is is just the way people treat him as a font of wisdom, even though he's not giving them anything except just a mirror of their own words back to them. Um, I'm not sure the sort of spectator theory of it all is something I can absorb into my brain this quickly and respond to, but it's cool. Yeah. Uh, also, another comment from YouTube. Um, I think in response to some. And Carla said, um, figured the return was already a bit of an upside down hero's tale when Coop becomes Dougie and doesn't beat Bob or the doppelganger. He's almost ancillary to it. I, mean, I guess there's nothing more absurd than that green glove. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And also that's a Cocteau link um, because yeah, for some reasons Cocteau used like also in this, you know, uh, surrealist sequence of his, uh, plastic like rubber gloves to like as keys to portal to another dimension which I don't know yeah I think it has definitely something to do with the role of the glove in the return. I see Andreas's comment that uh, the the question about a unified mythos might sound stupid or simplistic I'm um, certainly not it's, it's just that it's very hard to uh, absorb a question and, and answer it um, without having a, a back and forth. So I'm sorry if we didn't really get it completely. All right, uh, do we have any more questions at all? Just put your hand up or... Just checking. Joshua? Have you got something? All right. All right, I'm just trying to see if there's anything else. Well, if we're drawing to a close, we could announce our trivia contest for the end of this panel. But before we do that, um, I think on behalf of all of the organizers, we would love to thank you for your wonderful presentations. A huge thank you to Lindsay for moderating. And a thank you to the public for all of your questions and your comments. It's been really wonderful to hear your discussions and all these various approaches that have been uh, discussed here tonight. Excuse me if my vocabulary begins to appear a bit limited. <laughs> this is my second full day on Zoom. Yesterday I spent uh, 16 hours on Zoom, so my brain may be on a bit of a meltdown path right now. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to hand over the mic to Franck, who is going to tell you a little bit about what you can win and how to do so. 
Yes, thank you, Marisa. Uh, I apologize. Uh, I too feel like Dougie Jones right now <laughs> after two days of uh, constant Zoom uh, conferences, but uh, uh, presentations. So, but I hope to be able to uh, read this question to you that will uh, enable someone to win an issue of the Blue Rose magazine. Um, and this uh, question is for the people uh, in the Zoom, in the Zoom meeting to answer. Um, Okay, so at first we wanted to ask uh, this, uh, this question, but it's not the question you are going to have to answer. So the question we wanted to ask was, what was the first tweet that announced that Twin Peaks was coming back to the screen? Which shouldn't be too difficult to answer. Uh, so we thought that instead of asking you what was the tweet, we would ask you uh, and uh, get ready to your keyboards uh, when it was tweeted. The exact date. <clears throat> Not the fourteenth. Anybody without cheating? <laughs> Not the 13th, not the 12th, <laughs> not the 18th, the 3rd, <laughs> yes, correct, <laughs> the 3rd of October 2014. Congratulations to uh, Michael Zontos, who is going to win an issue of the Blue Rose magazine. Bravo. <laughs> Can you private message us your address so we can get that issue off to you? Sure, sure, I will do. So, uh, yes, thank you to uh, Lindsay Helm for presenting, for moderating this uh, panel. And thank you to our three panelists uh, for their great uh, presentations. It was a very interesting panel about mythology and philosophy. Um, now it is, it is 10.30 French time. Um, and our next uh, panel is at 11 French time, so in half an hour. So uh, please, um, you know, meet us again in half an hour, basically, for the last panel of the conference, uh, How the West Was Lost, that will be moderated by Adam Daniel. Uh, thank you again for everything and see you again in half an hour. And um, we'll leave the Zoom open. So if you'd like to stay in chat, show off your cats, uh, or any of the above, uh, feel free. Dogs are also okay, but most of us are cat people. I'm warning you. Airedales are acceptable. Can we see him or her? I have a cat here, but uh, he's not budging, so. Uh, yeah, sleeping, right? Oh, oh yeah, he's out. Oh, there you go, there's someone. Oh, here's a beauty coming our way. <laughs> What's his or her name? Uh, um, Coco, and she's not liking me because I just took her, I just turned the heater back on I've taken, and I had to take her away from it, so. That's right, you're in Oz and you're in the middle of winter right now, aren't you? Yeah, which is not terribly cold, but you know, for us it is. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Imagine early in the morning, uh, she doesn't really want to be disturbed. <laughs> no, not at all. Yes, though sitting up all night at the conference, I'm the person in the house that she <laughs> sleeps on, nobody else. But yes, so. That's the privilege, right? A privilege. <laughs> yes, indeed. So what's your cat? 
we have several with who they're all surprisingly quiet right now because normally if I didn't want them to be here, I'm convinced they would be um, and probably meowing very loudly. Let's see if we can get anyone awake. Okay. Do you want to go off? Yeah, come on. Uh, Here we've got front of us. Yeah. <laughs> it's very hot here, so the cats are all stretched out and, and sleeping quietly. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. No, not one in cuddles. <laughs> exactly. Well, that was a, that was a very fun session. Thank you very much. Oh, thanks yeah. so much for being here. You're very brave at four in the morning. Uh, indeed, I, I I had a a a quiet little nap while the break was on, so I'm all awake again. So looking forward looking forward to hearing Rob talk. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Cool. It's been a real challenge trying to find um, the right time frame to allow people from different time zones to join us. That's really important to us because, of course, what's wonderful about Zoom is not having these kind of geographic barriers that would normally impede people from, from traveling to be in the same physical space. But then there's always the issue of time. Yeah, well, if you want to be there, though, it's though it was quite funny yesterday hearing somebody from Waikato University with a Scottish accent and somebody in London with an Australian accent. So, so I'm a New Zealander as well as an Australian. So it's kind of, yeah, noticing those little antipodean things. We have another wonderful Australian joining us for the next panel. He also bravely agreed to do it in the morning for us. So we're happy about that. Oh, great. Excellent. Excellent. I'm really pleased because I feel like a lot of times here in Europe, just because of the time zone this past year with the Zoom conferences, we haven't had a lot of Aussie presentations. And I feel like it's one of a really exciting place for film writing. Um, we're, Frank and I are both really huge fans of Senses of Cinema, which of course comes to us via Australia. Oh, oh. indeed, indeed. It's actually, yes, I've actually turned my camera on because I do a bit of teaching and I know what it's like when nobody's got their camera on, but at least people are communicating here. I think in classes sometimes it's quite, an, it's an interesting thing. Yeah, it is strange. It is strange. I've had people come up to me and say hello, and I've got absolutely no idea who they are. It yeah. really, and it, it's so comforting, I think, to see facial expressions because we really rely on that, I think, as a way of really checking in with people when we're speaking. And I was also teaching a class the other day, and everybody turned off their camera, and it was a new class. So that was very, very strange not to really feel like I knew the students. Mm. Indeed, indeed. It is very disconcerting. Yeah, indeed. indeed. So we're going to be getting some face-to-face -face, um, next semester. So 
but then the international students will all be online too. So, yeah. How how do you think the hybrid model will? Um, I think it'll be it'll be face to face classes, and it'll be online classes. It won't be. I I find I do the film editing class, so there's practical. So if you've got somebody in the room, they're going to take up more time. So you just can't do them both at the same time. It's not fair to the online students. Will you be teaching a mixture? Uh, yeah, I think so as well. And I think, yeah, just like you are going to do separate um, courses, we'll have international students online and then try to do in-person teaching locally. And we'll see how it goes. I don't mind the online teaching in the sense that it really does facilitate for the international students. And I think that's something really positive. Yeah, indeed. I think it's kind of good for things like presentations because you can actually write notes without anybody seeing what, you, what you're writing is worth too. So it's, you know, and everybody focuses on them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I like the way that we can pop resources into the chat box if need be, that can be useful. I'm sure it's distracting sometimes yeah. if you're speaking and you also follow the chat. Um, for those watching, it can be helpful. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Though it's always the internet, though. People fading in and out of class, disappearing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Especially in Australia, we have terrible internet. So, but it seems to have been working quite well tonight, maybe because it's coming up to four or five in the morning and nobody's on it. Yeah. Well, that's the handy thing about our schedule, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, indeed, indeed. It's been very good. Oh no, it's actually coming up to seven o'clock. So, so everybody's going to be getting up soon. So, all right. There's that kind of eight a.m. rush to check email. I think, right? Yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed. No, the 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 the, fa the family will be getting up. So, yes, I'll, I might have to go back to my desk upstairs. Yeah. So are you going to do this conference? Are you going to try a conference every year or are you going to do point. this again? We hadn't thought about it. And then today, several times in the YouTube chat, we had people asking the very same question. And it seems that there is an interest. So I suppose we'll think about it. Um, why not? If, if there's enough interest, it would be wonderful. Yeah, definitely. What, what was your, when, I'm, when did you do your call out for um, papers? I think it was close to about nine months ago, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I'm sorry, Frank is telling July. Okay, July of last year. Okay. Mm -hmm. So initially, yeah. Frank had thought about proposing um, a Twin Peaks conference several years ago. And actually, even before the pandemic, he decided that maybe working online would be a nice way to do it in terms of bringing together more international scholars uh, who might not have the funding to travel, especially long distances. And then the pandemic happened, so we decided to go ahead with this online model. Yeah, different. Well, and international travelers become so expensive now too. Well, it has from where we are anyway. Yeah, that that would be great. Yeah. If you did it. Yeah. Hey, Roland, do you hear that? There's a lot of interest for us to do this again. Yes, it's been a long journey. It was it was in July, indeed. Yes. Mm -hmm. Perfectly remembers at the moment. Josh says funding yeah. academics in the same sentence. Ha ha ha. <laughs> Thanks, Josh. Yes, it has been incredible. <sighs> yeah. 
I agree with you, Lee. Yeah, saying that academics don't have much more in the way of travel funds. Yeah, and you know, even though in a lot of places things are beginning to look up, and that's wonderful, um, it's still pretty complicated to travel internationally right now. So I think, um, at least for this year, having it online was definitely the way to go. And as we have also talked about ecology earlier today, I guess that uh, if everyone was traveling by plane, uh, well, we shouldn't have a panel about ecology. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Also the solution. Yeah, that's very true. We're working with like a green consultant um, at work, and he's been telling us, you know, about specific issues facing the cultural sector. And one of the big ones, of course, is doing seminars and, and conferences. Um, and some of my colleagues asked about, you know, pollution in terms of the, the resources that working digitally take up. But he said for events like this, obviously, you know, the, the minor amount of energy required for a Zoom meeting like this is nothing, of course, compared to the travel uh, carbon footprint that would happen if all of us were traveling to the same physical place. Sure. Uh, indeed. Hey, Rob, how are you? I'm fine, yes. No, and I was also thinking that uh, uh, Marisa, Frank and I, we have spent so much time and energy of uh, about the content uh, uh, of this uh, event. Uh, we have also spent some uh, time with the technical aspect, but uh, uh, thankfully we didn't spend any time with uh, uh, checking the, the travels, uh, the hostels, uh, you know, uh, all these things that wouldn't, wouldn't have anything to do with uh, the content of uh, our conference. So that's a good aspect too. Yeah, definitely. And actually having disembodied people is in little boxes is probably a good thing for Twin Peaks anyway. Yeah. Hey there, Rob. How are you and doing? We not, and, we, and we wouldn't have been able to do it without a budget as well. So <laughs> is that true? Yeah. Hey, Rob, do you want to try your screen or are you feeling fine? Yeah, let me uh, give it a try here. Let's see, screen two, it says, let's see if you can see this. Is that, you see it? Yep. Okay, okay, that'll work. I'll uh, stop that share, but yeah, looking good. Do we have any other panelists here who would like to check their share screen option? Yeah, and sorry, could you let us know how to pronounce your name? Is it Mikhail or Mikhail? Oh, you're muted right now. Oh yes, true. So the name is Mikhail, Mikhail is good. Okay, thanks. And I will also try to share my screen. I'll let me just one second. It's working. It's working. Yeah. Perfect. Excellent. Thanks for checking. Thank you. I will try to stop sharing now. And I guess it was successful. <laughs> Great. Keep the suspense. <laughs> Excellent. And do we have Robert Sinnerbrink with us yet? I don't think he's here just yet. Okay. 
We'll wait for him. Ten minutes to go. Adam Daniel has entered the room. Hello, hello. Hi, Marissa. Hi, nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Thanks for coming Hi, back. Damn, you're in the right room. Yeah. <laughs> How are you doing? Uh, yeah, doing well, thanks. Yeah. Are you going to spend the next 25 years there? <laughs> I've been uh, catching up on your Twitter feed, Frank, on all these wonderful presentations. I can't wait to watch them on the, on the recording. Adam, we've got two of your panelists here, Rob, and Mikhail, and we are just waiting for Robert Sinnerbrink. Excellent. Is it seven in the morning for you, uh, Adam? Yeah. Yes, oh, it is. Another brave soul. <laughs> <laughs> Bit cold here this morning as well, but uh, got my coffee. I'm set. <laughs> We've had a few brave Aussies with us. Uh, we were just saying that it, it can be hard to find time zones for everyone, but we really tried to vary them because it's been so wonderful to have people uh, come all over. Yeah, then that's great. I know it's. I, I've yeah. I, I did an international conference earlier um, in the year and. It is so tricky to try and make it work for everyone, but but you do get the benefit of then having you know a, a wonderful cohort of people <laughs> join in. So definitely. Is your dog doing better, Adam? Yeah, he's um he's slept through the night without any problems, which is good. So he's booked in to go into the vet this morning. So thanks for asking. He's a, he's an old dog though, so he's he's almost fifteen. So he's just uh, it's it's understandable that he's not he's not at one hundred percent health. <laughs> it must be stressful though. So thank you for being here. I think oh, no, what we're all Thank normal people here. We've been showing off our pets in recent days. <laughs> Thanks for your understanding. Absolutely. Yeah. We hope for the best that he gets better soon. Thank you. He might um, make a cameo later. <laughs> he's he's sleeping now, but uh, if he if he gets up, I'll. I'll introduce him. <laughs> That'd be lovely. We can send him our best wishes in prison. <laughs> uh, thank you. Our cats make, make cat deals, so. And just so you know, we've also got a live stream running on YouTube. So I'll be going back and forth between the Zoom window and the YouTube window. If we have comments or questions come in on YouTube, I'll paste them in the chat here. Wonderful. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Oh.
we have any other Europeans here who have been with us all day? Oh, I see Bernard and yeah, Mikhail. We're hanging in there. It's 11 o'clock almost. <laughs> Yeah, you're drinking coffee, but for different reasons. <laughs> Not to wake up, just to keep it, keep the uh, energy up. Yeah, nice, Mikhail. <laughs> but Roland, the, the good news is that the storms. Passed. Not coffee, actually, but I want to make the legend. <laughs> The, the big thing here is that in France, we've been having really terrible thunderstorms um, that threatened to knock out our power. Right. <laughs> we've had people's roofs taken off yesterday. Um, but fortunately, everything seems to be a lot calmer right now. It was in the Netherlands too, but it was calmer uh, yesterday. <laughs> so you also had a lot of rain and thunder. Yeah, last night was crazy, yeah. I didn't hear about much uh, destruction of property or anything, but it was quite intense. Yeah. And I don't know if you were here with us last night, but when the woodsmen came for their appearance, for us, that's the moment when everything was so crazy. Yeah, I see. you mentioned something, right? During the, the situation, yeah. Because Roland uh, lost his connection temporarily. I thought we might reenact the scene, you know, in, in which the woodsmen come out of the night sky with the, the lightning appearing. <laughs> Got the lights. I'm following chat here. Yeah, I do drink David Lynch coffee. I just ran out, but I bought uh, a single bag of the David Lynch and then their Pride blend this month. So, so I'm drinking the Pride blend of coffee. Not right now because, you know, nerves and stuff. I don't want to just blow through this presentation. So. Hmm. And how did the two compare? Yeah, the David Lynch tends to be like the, the Twin Peaks 30th anniversary. I just got one bag of that. They were almost sold out. It was really rich, dark. They were emulating that Black Lodge thing. I think that was intentional. Then the, the David Lynch Espresso Rose, that, that's what I've been getting. It's really rich, really good coffee. Uh, the Pride Blend is intentionally has these really uh, fruit forward flavors. And it said that on the packet. And when I got a sip, they weren't joking. It's uh, very bright. It's uh, really good. Nice. We're going to have to try that. I have to admit, I'm not a huge coffee drinker. I know this is sacrilege to say in a Twin Peaks environment, but I'll have to give it a go. Hey, I'm when drinking a cappuccino it. anyway. So, so I'll when join you. Had coffee through the night, but tea now. When I do some Lynch and events in my heart house uh, cinema, I uh, offer some uh, David Lynch coffee to all the uh, participants. Lovely. I've got a big bag. <laughs> okay, we'll just wait another two minutes. Welcome back to those who are just joining us.
I don't see Robert Sinnerbrink here yet. If you're using an account with a different name, could you let us know, please? Mm -hmm. I think he's scheduled to speak last. So, ah, yep. here he yeah. is. there? Great. Perfect timing. Okay, so if you're all ready, I, su I suggest that we start this uh, last uh, panel of the conference. So good evening, good morning, good afternoon. Um, this is indeed the last um, panel of our uh, two days long conference dedicated to Twin Peaks The Return. So it's panel number 10, the number of com completion. Uh, and this uh, panel will be moderated by um, Adam Daniel. Um, uh, and uh, we'll be dealing with the topic of how the West was lost. Before uh, I give the floor to Adam, I just want to thank once more uh, all the people who, are, who were, who are involved in this conference, uh, starting with Marissa and Roland from Lynchland, uh, who have, uh, you know, with me uh, really worked hard to make this weekend for all of you. So we hope it was uh, it's not finished, but we hope that uh, the, the, the whole weekend is an enjoyable uh, moment for you. And thank you so much to all of our partners, to the three universities first that uh, accompanied us, uh, the University of Liège in Belgium, the University of bordeaux Montaigne in France, and the University of Cork in Ireland. Thank you very much to the David Lynch School of Cinematic Arts for their support, to Intellect, to Supernatural Studies, and finally to uh, the French cinema magazine La Septième Obsession. Um, I give the floor now to Adam for this uh, 10th panel, How the West Was Lost. Thank you, Frank. Uh, and Thank you so much to the conference organizers for inviting me to moderate this panel. I'm really excited to hear from three uh, wonderful scholars on three very interesting topics. Um, so we will have Rob King from Texas Tech University. Adam, we can't hear you. I could hear him. So can I. Oh, good. Okay. I'm not sure. Maybe I'll just, uh, you got me okay now? So we Rocky have, uh, fantastic, great. So we're, we're fortunate to have Rob King from Texas Tech University, Mikhail Zontos and Robert Sinebrink, uh, a nice familiar face. Hi, Robert, welcome uh, from Macquarie University presenting today. And um, we will begin uh, this session with Rob, if that's okay. Okay, um, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, organizers, for putting this together. It has been a wonderful conference from start to finish, as much of it. I missed that first session, but I'm going to watch that recording. So thank you. Thank you for your time organizing this, going through the thunderstorms. Those of you that are up at 7 in the morning or 5 in the morning for some of you. Uh, okay, so I'm going to share my screen. And let's see if I can get this in presentation mode for you. Okay. Are you all able to see that and hear me? Looks great. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so what I'll be talking about today is Twin Peaks The Return as Reimagined Frontier Narrative. I'm taking a regionalist approach to this. Uh, again, Rob King, I'm an associate librarian at Texas Tech University's Southwest Collection, Special Collections Library. Uh, I've also just finished my first year as a PhD student with uh, Texas Tech University's Department of English. Um, I have written on Twin Peaks before. I've done that for 25 years later, Blue Rose Magazine, New American Notes Online, their special issue 15. And I'm an editor on an upcoming collection of essays tentatively titled, uh, this could change, The American West in David Lynch's Filmography and in Twin Peaks essays on regional identity, narratives, and history. There are um, th going to be three essays and, uh, no, I'm sorry, 
three interviews and 12 essays uh, in the entirety book. We just got the peer review uh, back, blind peer review praised it, but that's the beginning of a conversation. So if y'all have papers on this subject, keep publishing them. Okay, so there is a recent episode of Pure Cinema Podcast from April 19, 2021. You can look it up now, where host Eric King closes the two-part series on the films of David Lynch, claiming that Lynch will be remembered as a truly great American artist. Lynch's works, excepting for Dune, are always in America. All, the, all of these films were him exploring America itself, the America he remembers, and that he was always interested in. And I think that sets him apart from a lot of other filmmakers and artists, end quote. This is a notion I hope to expand upon looking specifically at the return and its communication with the regional American West. So the outline of what I'm going to do here is I'm going to be scaffolding some from some previous research I did on Twin Peaks The Return as a Western and then get into the new chapter that'll come out in that forthcoming book. And I hope it communicates everything I wanted to after editing it down. We'll look at it as reimagined West with a heritage of California fiction and American trauma. So Western genre specifically versus Western regionalism is an important distinction in staging this. We have a little bit of both here. We can easily speak to Las Vegas, to gold rushes of natures both alchemical or spiritual and of greed, about black gold, petroculture, oil. Of course, we have to think about the cowboy and his eventual embodiment in the pulp detective or private eye. I will leave the very real topics of indigeneity to those scholars who have already written so well and authoritatively on the subject. I think of authors Jeff Bill, and then David Titterington's articles for 25 years later. But we can acknowledge his existence, uh, which continues to beg even more critical attention. Still, there are borders, sheriffs, judges, portrayals of damsels in distress, uh, brothels, and old Hollywood around every corner and haunted by untraditional enemies in our storyline here. UFOs, mysterial, mysterious lights in rural spaces, and nuclear testing. So just how did Cooper get entangled in a mystery surrounded by majestic Douglas firs and then get redirected to such dire desert landscapes? There are horses, magic, incantation in the lodge, tobacco with the woodsmen, oil in Odessa, Texas, and a shootout over coffee, Judy's. So what can it all mean? In Mark Frost's The Secret History of Twin Peaks, he enmeshes the larger story into an American history less discussed, a Western one, with mysteries, secret societies, evils, and magic. Upon closer examination, it is hard to distinguish what is real and what is not. We know we are watching and reading a fictional story, and yet so much of it begins to get confused with the reality. It puts me in mind of the following quote. Josh Garrett Davis notes in What is a Western? genre, region, imagination. You'll see the uh, cover of that later. It seems that frequently Western regional art evokes the genre Western, which itself depends on and is inspired by the reality of the West, such that the two cannot be cleanly distinguished. So now we will look at some of what I've looked at previously here. New ghost town imagery. So what I was looking at here is specifically that uh, Rancho Rosa, so Rosa, there in uh, Las Vegas, the abandoned development. And, and that picture, it's gonna be hard, I don't know if you can read that text, booming oil towns prepare for inevitable bust. That comes from Odessa, Texas, just from a few years ago. They had a large uh, oil boom. And so they had these large developments you could drive through just about that time around 2000, 15, 2012, 2015, they've been kind of started diving down. And I would drive through and see these abandoned structures. I think they're filled back up now. But new ghost town imagery, which uh, Mark Frost spoke to when he spoke to the Austin Film Festival. So scaffolding to the next. So then I looked at part eight. I was looking at the regionality of the Trinity test in New Mexico. So this is looking at regionalism and traumatic history. Uh, the Jornada del Muerto, this is the journey of death next to white, the White Sands Desert outside of Alamogordo, New Mexico. 
So that adds part of that Southwestern regionalism that we're looking at in the return. Next, I was kind of uh, bridging from there. I had looked at um, desert ritual and rocketry, and these ideas are coming from that New American Notes Online special issue, uh, issue 15. You can go back and look at my expansion on this. But Jack Parsons experiments in the California deserts of the Arroyo Seco, and according to Frost narrative, again, near the Jornada del Muerto in the desert there, which I would say just even this week, there's still rocketry experimentation going out in these southwestern deserts as Jeff Bezos from Amazon has his space rocket program out toward Big Bend, far west Texas. And they were just going to do a launch this week. So these rocketry experiments and the regionality is what I was looking at in conversation with the secret history of Twin Peaks. And then to look at probably the most obvious element is to go to that episode part 18, or I said episode, but part 18, uh, with Cooper at the Judy's steak, or, or, uh, diner. And, and here we had intentionality of the Western, even in the casting, as Francesca Eastwood, daughter of Clint Eastwood, famous Western actor, is the waitress in that scene. And then if we look at the intentionality from a film and media studies, kind of a, a film reading, looking at the, uh, the mise-en-scene of it, what we have here, we'll get to the cowboy shot, but look at the, the setting. We have, of course, the guys in the cowboy attire, but we have the wooden beams on the back wall, the horseshoes, the horns. We have the saloon bar, more of a diner bar. But what we have here is a shootout at the OK Corral is what I'm suggesting, in, in uh, essence. And as the Cowboys begin to approach Cooper to the booth, what we have here is kind of a change in power dynamic. And what we have is a low angle, what they call a cowboy shot of the Cowboys. That usually is a cutoff mid thigh where you would see the guns and the belt holster and then above. So intentionality in casting, in the mise-en-scene, and in the editing, and the cut shots, we see the Western portrayed, the old Western genre is what we're looking at there. So the important transition I'm kind of noting here is from cowboy to film noir to detective private eye agent, and then that carries into neo-noir, which we end up with in this. So reimagined frontier narratives. This is the new chapter. This is what I'm developing currently. And I'll, I'll start reading on the paper from here. When genre Westerns began to fade in popularity, their conventions remained in reimagined frontier narratives. These reimagined frontier narratives are a combination of noir, regional and contemporary narratives that, can, that incorporate and reflect new realities of the West. David Lynch's Twin Peaks and his LA trilogy, Lost Highway, Mulholland Drive, and Inland Empire all take place primarily in the American West and can be read as reimagined frontier narratives. Reimagined frontier narratives find their origins in Depression era California noir and communicate a traumatized American dream at the terminus, that's the end, of the mythic and geographic American West. The Lynch-directed narratives are an extension of this fictional expression with their own specific reactions and statements on the aftermath of 19th century Western expansionism and its implied promises. The early chapters of Twin Peaks arrived in 1990 to 1992, <clears throat> years that Michael Craig Gibbs claims as the tail end of postmodernism, if one accepts the notion that we have moved on to a new artistic paradigm in the 21st century. This is a time Gibbs goes on to state when the traditional Western as a literary form would begin to disappear with some last efforts by writers like Larry McMurtry and Cormac McCarthy to deconstruct and reimagine it. As Alexandra Keller identifies the Western's near disappearance after the critical and financial disaster of Heaven's Gate in 1980 and its resurgence with the Oscar-winning Dances with Wolves in 1990 and Unforgiven in 1992 coincide with the seismic shifts in American culture that were the Reagan-Bush one years, 1980 through 1992. 
The introduction of Twin Peaks in 1990 with its initial closing in the film uh, Twin Peaks Fire Walk With Me in 1992, the tail end of the Reagan Bush one years, is then historically and timely telling. It is also valuable to note that David Lynch and Barry Gifford's Lost Highway is an exploratory reaction to the O.J. Simpson murder trial, and that Mulholland Drive premiered short of a month following September 11, 2001 World Trade Center attack. All of these premieres occurred during major signposts of American drama. Additionally, Mark Frost and David Lynch wrote the continuation of the transmedia of Twin Peaks in script and in novel in 2012 with the context of the 2008 recession and their generation's late age post-nuclear trauma clearly in mind. In the company of California fiction, Lynch's narratives are also updates on regional American Western narratives as their noir conventions reflect a heritage of the urban cowboy. While Lynch is not a director of contemporary or neo-Westerns, the traumas he engages with his regional Western narratives and characters communicate the American people's conflicted interiority following 19th century westward expansion. American cultural studies recognize the complexities in defining the American dream. The American dream is a complex concept. We can call it an ethos, or in the terms of the myth and symbol school in American studies, a modern myth. It includes the idea of freedom as the opportunity for prosperity and success, usually in the form of class mobility through hard work. Ideologically, the American dream includes self-made solvency, rugged individualism, wealth or capitalist, melting pot unity and comfort and armed religious piety. Today's tra uh, traumatized dream encompasses perspectives on those ideals as tested by civil war, depressions and recessions, civil rights struggles, nuclear warfare, growing minor uh, minority and diversity movements and terrorism domestic and international. Yet the struggling dream remains stubbornly hegemonic, disillusioned by its failed promises, a blurring of church and state separations and a catalyst for poisonous nationalism. Lynch's narratives and protagonists are reactionary to this environment. These ideals and emotions are at the center of the darkness and spiritual thirst portrayed in Lynch's films, Industrial Nightmares, Lost Highway as a reaction to the OJ trial, Hollywood betrayals, and small towns hidden in the woods of the West where a murder is not a simple statistic and a yellow light still means slow down. With the incorporation of these elements, his regional Western narratives have been categorized as a form of neo-noir. <clears throat> Film noir is a narrative genre that burgeoned in America with the ultimate cast of urban cowboys, detectives, private eyes, and lone agents. Critically unidentified as such until the 1970s, film noirs were prominent in the 1940s and 50s. Many were based on novels written by California authors during the Great Depression. David Fine, author of Imagining Los Angeles, a city in fiction, claims that these depression-crazed middle classes of Southern California became in one mode or another the original protagonists in that great anti-myth, usually known as noir. Still hardened by their environments, the odds these film and literature cowboys were up against continue to require a personal code for survival. Looking at my time here. Um, he is the urban cowboy, complete with codes governing behavior, speech, etc. But this character must still operate in a still concrete and glass frontier, a place where crime, corruption, and overpopulation dominate uh, the natural environment and has receded into mere pockets, wilderness pockets. The expansion on these tropes encompassing films such as 1974's Chinatown, 1981's Body Heat, 1997's Lost Highway, and Twin Peaks The Return it is neo-noir. According to Douglas Kesey and Neo Norris, the, the city country distinction breaks down as crime corruption are shown to be present even in sunny climes, white noir, and agrarian locales, country noir. And it is through their neo noir uh, styling and incorporation of nostalgia that Lynch and his collaborators create innovative, reimagined frontier narratives, inviting audiences to become voyeurs of their perspectives on American lives in the contemporary West. The West in Lynch's films is a destination for traumas. Lost Highway's Fred Madison has a destiny of violence. As he reconciles his murder of his wife, Renee, through the dreamed persona of Pete Dayton, the destination is always the same. Fred is a murderer. In Fred's dream, his destiny of wielding a gunman's pistol involves a very specific setting from the screenplay. 
were floating down an old two-lane highway through a desolate desert landscape. While it, uh, end quote, while it appears that the mystery man is the one who shoots Mr. Eddie Laurent back to the screenplay, the camera cuts back wide to reveal Fred holding the gun. He is standing alone. There is no mystery man, end quote. He is a lone gunman who is lodged at the Lost Highway Hotel out in the desolate desert landscape. This scenario is both Old West and neo-noir because Lynch removes Madison's Los Angeles murder to the western desert beyond the city. Regarding Twin Peaks' use of the hotel, Monica Montalongo Flores writes, what is critical in Twin Peaks' recasting of the hotel, the traditional western hotel is what she's speaking to, is that the site signifies a supernatural doorway, fusing the western's gateway to civilization with the horror genre's place for paranormal activities. This postmodern approach encourages viewers to compare the site's treatment within and without the Western genre. Agent Cooper rides a similar, though one could argue the same, old two-lane highway as that of Fred Madison and Pete uh, Dayton en route to the Pearl, uh, Pearl Blossom Motel in a desolate desert landscape in Twin Peaks Season 3, Part 18. His road literally leads him to an Old West gun standoff for a woman's honor in, Odessa, in the Odessa, Texas diner. While Fred Madison's narrative asks questions about the soul of the contemporary Los Angeles man, the Cooper or Richard standoff asks the same question of the contemporary fiction detective exposing its Western roots. David Lynch's mysterious neo-noirs follow in this tradition. He is not a director of contemporary nor neo-Westerns, but the traumas he's engaging with his Western-located fiction and characters have destinations that come with bills to be paid, representing the American's conflicted interiority at the terminus, that's the end, of geographic Western expansionism, where it began to roll back. In this context, his films are artistic extensions, a new way of thinking on the reimagined frontier narrative as it evolved in California fiction of the 20s and 30s. I elaborate more on that in the fuller chapter. Uh, these neo-noirs affirm and acknowledge their heritage to California fiction, where audiences can look for evidence of the evolution of the Western hero or Western hero narratives and the traumatized American dream. So that is all I have today. And uh, uh, I wish I had more time to share more with you. So thank you. And I'll stop. Bravo, Rob. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I just a question on, um, from the chat while you're presenting. Um, just if you can share the information regarding the podcast that you talked about in the beginning. Yeah, sure. Uh, what was the question on the podcast? Uh, yes, yeah. I, I will type it in here. Wonderful. Yes, I will do that. That's great. Well, I'll open the floor first just to see if anybody else has a question or a comment that they'd like to share. And if not, I might get started. Well, I'll, I'll offer a, uh, a question. I'd, lo I'd love to hear your reflections, Rob, on just, uh, you know, wonderful paper, really fascinating um, and interesting uh, perspective on thinking through, particularly, obviously, you know, that, as you mentioned, the, the move from the Douglas firs to the desert that we see in this, um, this new iteration of Twin Peaks. And I'm, I'm curious, as to your reading of the three Coopers, um, the Mr. C, the Dougie and Cooper in terms of how they might be reflections of the Western archetypes. Yeah, uh, so, so I, I think back to that uh, design that maybe a lot of us saw, the good, the bad and the Dougie, um, you know, that that's where I would read it, you know, maybe about as far as that. I I, I look more at the um, the detective, that noir detective, and, and how um, here's the cat uh, cameo. The um, I guess I'm looking at how the the western really changed as the west grew and it reached as far as it could go, and then society began to develop. Well, by the 
you know, you had that early, that turn of the 19th century cowboy and Western story that as society grew up around them, I think eventually they became the detective, the private detective. And, and so I, I'm really focusing on that transition. And it's about that personal code. It was the behavior of that, um, well, the that kind of a uh, pulp fiction detective, the hard boiled detective, maybe even more so, uh, with the questionable ethics, but was responsible for, for all those other uh, characters. Let me see if I'm gonna scoop this character out of here, excuse me. And um, so, so that's the transition I'm interested in. As far as the, the, the bad Dougie, clearly, uh, you know, you kind of had the cowboy in white and the cowboy in black. And I think that Mr. C is clearly kind of a cowboy in black in that scenario. Uh, I have no idea where to include Dougie in all this, maybe just the Dougie. And um, that's all I would have on that. You know. That's great. Yeah, it's a, it's a tricky one to find where he would fit within those, uh, where, where Dougie fits within that kind of classical archetype uh, um, of, of you know, the, the Western characters. And I'm glad to answer questions at the end if the other speakers want to go and just answer toward the end. So, great. Well, unless anybody else has a specific question for Rom, we might do that because it might be a case of I think all of these papers speaking to each other and might generate some really interesting questions uh, upon reflection. All right. Well. I will uh, shift over then to introduce Mikhail Zontos. So Mikhail, uh, Mikhail's presentation today is entitled Incinerating the American Myth in Twin Peaks Season 3. And uh, welcome, Mikhail. I think you can, you can begin when you're ready. Thank you very much, Adam, and uh, also the organizers and everyone who is here for this amazing conference, also Rob for his uh, great presentation. Uh, so I will uh, begin by attempting to share my screen and uh, let's see if this works. Um, okay, you should be watching now the title of my presentation. Yep. Got that. Perfect. Perfect. So uh, my presentation will explore um, the American myth of pastoralism in Twin Peaks and particularly the denial and eventual disillusion of this myth in Twin Peaks, the return. Now, in order to do so, I will need to speak for a while for some things that initially might uh, sound irrelevant to Twin Peaks, but don't worry. It will be like a Dale Cooper show this in the return, but in the end, I will take you back to, to Twin Peaks. So... As Leo Marx notes in his classic study, The Machine in the Garden, the pastoral idea has been used to define the meaning of America ever since the age of discovery. The term indicates a yearning for a simpler, more harmonious style of life and existence closer to nature. Pastoralism, of course, is a concept older than the discovery of America, finding its roots in the writings of Theocritus and Virgil. And in a way, the idea of America as a garden of escape has been older than the discovery of the continent itself. Long before Europeans stepped on American shores, they had already in their minds stories about places such as Atlantis, Elysium, Arcadia, Garden of Even, and a longing for a long gone golden age during which life was simpler and more meaningful. Upon the discovery of America, Europeans projected these concepts on the new continent. This was a continent untouched by nature, as Leo Marx notes, land in its natural state, a world as uh, the world was supposed to be before civilization. Essentially, discovering America meant returning to paradise. Marx underlines that this idea of the newly discovered continent as a prelapsarian Eden is central in the writings of the Elizabethan era and fueled the drive for, of colonization. Escape toward America indicated a desire to escape from the artificial world of um, culture and civilization, an escape from sophistication toward simplicity, essentially an escape from the city toward the country. Those moving to the new continent could begin anew and achieve their dreams. Here was an early expression of the American dream. In this place, everyone could find a place under the sun and enjoy, as Thomas Jefferson would later put it in the US Declaration of Independence, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. However, the stark realities of life in the colonies encountered by those who decided to see the new continent for themselves led to a conflicting metaphor of America as a hideous wilderness. 
this metaphor so the new world as hell is darkness that arouses the fear of malevolent forces in the cosmos and of the cannibalistic and bestial traits in men, um, as uh, Leo Marx puts it. And here I will take you to some uh, visual representations of this um, these concepts by using uh, some paintings from um, Thomas Cole, no relation to Gordon Cole from what I know. Uh, so uh, Thomas Cole uh, prepared a, a series of five paintings called The Course of Empire in which he shows the development of civilization. In the first painting, The Savage State, we see basically mankind in the early beginnings. Here nature is dominant, the landscape is dark and wild, and uh, we can see some people here, but we are not certain if they live a very happy life. Eventually, uh, civilization develops towards the Arcadian or pastoral state, which uh, shows a, a balance uh, between the human and the natural. And this is the idea, the agrarian pastoral states. Uh, Marx underlines that these Elizabethan images of America stand at opposing sides. The garden image is a utopian image that promises escape from history. The hideous wilderness image views America as another field for the exercise of power. In other words, the use of force was essential to tame the wilderness, but also meant the destruction of the garden. America was destined to end up like the rest of the world. Civilization was going to destroy Eden once more, as it had happened in the old world, and the city was bound to obliterate the country, leading in the third painting of Thomas Cole, The Consummation of Empire, where civilization has uh, replaced uh, the pastoral landscape. With the colonization of the Great West in the next centuries and the advent of industrialization during the 19th century, the duality between the garden and the wilderness gave place to the duality between the garden and its counterforce, industrialism. When historian Frederick Jackson Turner proclaimed in his frontier thesis in 1898 that the frontier was virtually gone, he knew that wilderness was a thing of the past and worried about how Americans would retain the traits of the frontiering experience, their frontiersman cowboy character, if you will, during a time of great cities, industrialism, and gradual civilizing of a country that's forged its natural character in the primitive conditions of the West. Historian David Robel mentioned this, uh, the term frontier anxiety uh, that characterizes American history ever since. And this is something that, that we can see in the return in the longing of um, uh, Dougie White for this uh, statue that represents uh, the cowboy, a lawmaker of the Old West. Uh, this uh, process can also be seen in this wonderful painting by John Gast, uh, showing the American progress. We see on the one side the old America, the original America uh, receding, the buffaloes are leaving, the Native Americans are leaving, chased by stagecoach, the frontiersmen are coming, the locomotive, and in the end, on the other side, we see the, crea the creation and building of uh, modern American cities. The question between agrarianism and industrialism uh, appears with urgency in the literature of the, of the 19th century. In the writings of Hawthorne, Melvin, Twain, and others, Marx reminds us we step into a peaceful, quiet, Edenic American garden only to have our calmness disturbed by the sudden, sudden sound of a steamboat or a locomotive. The machine's incursion into the garden, as presented in both popular and hybrid literature of the period, underlines discontent about the direction of the country. Although most intellectuals and politicians embraced industrialism as the prerequisite of progress, there was a certain frustration on how it could be compatible with the American longing for the countryside. Uh, for example, one of the most acute observers of the times, Henry Adams, historian and descendant of two American presidents, wrote to his brother in 1862, you may think all this nonsense, but I tell you these are great times. Man has mounted science and is now run away with. I firmly believe that before many centuries more, science will be the master of man. The engines he will have invented will be beyond his strength to control. Someday, science may have the existence of mankind in its power, and the human race commit suicide by blowing up the world. A rather prophetic observation, perhaps. However, the ideal balance appears to be found in what Marx calls the middle landscape. An ideal place find somewhere between the wilderness and the city, which retains as much as possible the Jeffersonian ideal of a republic of human farmers. If the machine was bound to enter the garden, at least it could blend harmoniously into American countryside, and Americans could use it to improve their lives without succumbing to the negative aspects of civilization. 
Americans have sought to find the middle landscape by moving to the suburbs in the 50s and 60s, by preferring products whose advertisements make references to the single life of the past, to recall the typical cowboy in past cigarette advertisements, and by a constant desire to retreat in the countryside. Perhaps you may uh, recall that the two doctors in uh, the return, um, uh, Dr. Amp and Dr. Will Wayward, have indeed uh, tried to find uh, a better life further away in uh, the wilderness or the woods or whatever it is. Uh, the ideal middle place, however, is located somewhere close to nature and keeps communication with the city so it can profit from both worlds. The ide ideal middle landscape uh, is a town like Twin Peaks. This is perfectly evident in the opening sequence of the series, of the original series, in which images of a lumber mill gently polluting the air with its chimneys blends naturally with images of pristine lakes, birds, waterfalls, and forests under a dreamy pop soundtrack. This sequence reminds of George Ines' 1855 painting, The Lackawanna Valley, in which the locomotive and factories appear as natural elements of the American landscape. The relaxed figure in the middle of this painting is not bothered by what we may perceive as dissonance. In a middle landscape, the blending of the garden with elements of the machine seems natural. Moreover, we can see the typical American attitude toward the garden myth in Special Agent Dale Cooper's excitement while entering the town of Twin Peaks. I've never seen so many trees in my life, he proclaims in profound admiration. Indeed, in the original two seasons, the town itself represents an idyllic paradise threatened by rather mild interruptions of modernity. A picturesque hotel next to a wonderful, the lumber mill, or special agent uh, Albert Rosenfeld's metropolitan attitude and methods. Regardless of these examples and constant suggestions that evil may somehow be related to these invasions, it is at least I remember suggested once in the series that Cooper himself, who came from the city, may have been the heartbreaker of evil. These examples blend into the dominant garden image of the town and the nostalgia for the 50s small town optimism remains in the viewer's memory, despite the crimes committed in the town and the ominous finale of season two. The nostalgic images of Twin Peaks as a middle landscape, however, are entirely absent from Twin Peaks The Return. If, as cultural critic Grail Marcus has noted, the town of Twin Peaks in the original run of the series was a blend of the Sylvan Village and the film noir city. In the return of the Sylvan Village, middle landscape has been swallowed entirely by the film noir city. Not only do big chunks of the plot take place in archetypal film noir cities, such as Las Vegas, New York, or Philadelphia, but Twin Peaks itself in the 25 years since the haunted finale of season two has radically changed. The town is now dark and depressing, and in most cases we found ourselves there, we view the interior of places that indicate connection with organized society, that is with civilization, the police station, the petrol store, the roadhouse, and the double R. The parts of the plot that occur in nature take mostly place in the deep dark wood outside Twin Peaks and are mostly horrifying. It is, however, the disruptive power of technology that plants the town into confusion and disarray. Recall that it takes uh, Lucy Brennan 17 episodes to figure out how mobile phones work and a couple of decades before I imagine. The impressive old fashioned FBI machines that quote unquote gazes don't do much to assist them as in uncovering the mysteries of the series. Electricity, this great Lynchian fear is a constant menace and the shiny slot machines in the casinos promise millions to many who perhaps did not make it in America while are actually Pro, uh, granting millions to the underworld yeah, like following so divine intervention to a lucky yet confused Dougie yeah. Jones. Someone manufactured you, Mike says, while meeting one of the tulpas in the red room. He could simply refer to every technological invention that has threatened the garden myth. But it is an episode date where Leeds and Frost decide to resolve once and for all the tension between the machine and the garden in American culture. In a series preoccupied with doppelgangers, owls that are not what they seem, giants, and mystical places out of our world, the episode brings abruptly and urgently history back to the series. The episode's depiction of the Trinity nuclear test in the Jornada del Muerto Desert in New Mexico at 5.29 a.m. on July 1945 shows the invention of the atomic bomb as the catalyst that solidifies pure evil in America. Gone are the days when the locomotive could blend in the wilderness. Here is a man-made machine that has no desire to coexist with the garden. The destructive force released by the explosion disrupts not only the natural landscape, but also time and memory itself. The nation's image of the past gets distorted into an ugly dark mirror of itself. 
a woodsman uncannily resembling Abraham Lincoln, the president who lived in a long cabin and mastered the wilderness, infiltrates a radio station, a temple of free speech and artistic expression, one may say, and renders the nation unconscious. Less than a month later, the atomic explosions in Hiroshima and Nagasaki would find the United States ending victoriously the Second World War in the Pacific. It can be argued that the bomb turned America into an empire, but at what cost? Whatever relation there is in the world today, political journalist Norman Cousins wrote in a long editorial called The Modern Man is Obsolete, a few days after the bombings in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, is severely tempered by a primitive fear, the fear of the unknown, the fear of forces man can neither channel nor comprehend. This fear is not new, it has become intensified, magnified. It has burst out of the subconscious and into the conscious, filling the mind with primordial apprehensions. By revisiting these events, episode eight makes clear that by playing with cosmic forces beyond its comprehension, the United States lost part of its soul. Lincoln once had stated, we shall nobly save or mainly lose the last best hope on earth. Following the Trinity explosion, Lincoln's doppelganger can only utter the phrase, got a light, a question that has already been answered by the fire that allowed the evil of Bob to enter the world of the living. When this kind of fire starts, the local lady says to Laura Palmer in a scene of fire, walk with me, it's very hard to pull out. The tender boughs of innocence burn first and the flame rises, and then all goodness is in jeopardy. It is easy to agree with Grail Marcus in his assessment that uh, she is talking about a girl lightening the fires of hell, a witch binding herself to her own stake and lightening her own pyre. But while the original series and the film focused on the tragedy of a woman and a town, both as metaphors for America, the return doesn't need any metaphors. It is about America, about the fire the country itself started without being able to control or understand. According to Walter Meltz, as the Shining's Hotel was built atop the grounds of Indian massacres, the plot of Twin Peaks emerges from a more recent scene of the United States government, the deployment of nuclear weapons. A Lovecraftian, Lovecraftian cosmic horror informs the moments after the explosion in the episodes as we realize that the apparitions that enter the world following the explosion, the experiment, Bob and the woodsmen who settle inside a convenience store represent cosmic forces that may be entirely indifferent to mankind. The same can be said for the seemingly good forces who view the events from the safety of the Blue Room or White Lodge, the fireman and uh, Senorita Dito. They both work to construct the essence of Laura Palmer and send it to Earth as a counterforce to Bob. But did they intend Laura's encounter with Bob to end up as it did in the show? Did they even care? We cannot really know. It is, however, important that they send Laura Palmer to Earth in the form of a golden light orb that resembles the sun. Because as again Leo Marx reminds us, the opposition between satanic fire and life-giving sun, light of divine truth and righteousness, is a recurring device in the work of writers such as Dante, Milton, and Hawthorne. Fire, as a representation of technology, goes back to the Promethean legend and the Christian myth that link the gift of knowledge with the inevitable fall, resulting from mankind's inability to handle knowledge properly. In Eden before the fall, technology was not needed. It became a necessity in the struggle for survival that accompanied mankind after divine rejection. Laura Palmer then, having been sent to earth in the form of the sun, an angelic force of nature to balance the evil of technology, represents in a way the tragedy of America, a country whose constitutional texts and myths are filled with noble intentions destined to experience again and again the betrayal of its aspiration. Greg Marcus has summarized perfectly this tragedy, which is constantly, I believe, referenced in Twin Peaks. The promises made in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, the promise that all would find themselves free to say what they had to say, the guarantee of equal justice under law, that governments were formed to respect and protect those rights, that citizens owed governments no respect if they did not, were so great that their betrayal was part of the promise. America is a country built on ideas, Marcus tells us, and the ideals may fail to come to fruition. It is interesting that the essence of this tragedy is spelled out in detail in one of the funniest uh, moments of the return. In Michael Serra's cameo, during which he appears as Wooly, Andy and Lucy's Marlon Brando-like son, we get the most nostalgic image of both Twin Peaks and America, and at the same time, a clear rejection of that nostalgia. I have crisscrossed this great can land of ours countless times. I hold the map of it right here in my heart, next to the joyful memories of the carefree days I spent as a young boy here in your beautiful town of Twin Peaks. From Alexandria, Virginia to Stockton, California, I think about Lewis and his friend Clark, the first Caucasians to see this part of the world. 
Their footsteps have been the highways and byways of my days on the road. This is a lovely piece of Americana, perhaps awkwardly put, but we should not forget one of the main reasons Wool is back in Twin Peaks, a matter of grave concern for his parents, as he underlines. To finally give permission to his parents to do as they wish with his childhood bedroom. Wool's frequent trips throughout the country following the steps of those who explored what they thought of as virgin land took place while Wooly rejected to abandon childhood. We cannot know if he will eventually grow out of his Easy Rider lifestyle and his Marlon Brando costume, but his parents will build a study in the bedroom now. So perhaps where one, once dreams of freedom were nurtured, now research on the failures born out of this freedom can be conducted. It is in the final moments. Uh, I hope, uh, Adam, I'm well with time. I'm almost there. <laughs> You're doing fine, Mikhail. Perfect. Thank you very much. So uh, it is in the final moments of the series, in episode 18, where Lynch and Frost's pessimistic outlook on the course of America is mostly clear. An exhausted, serious, and tired Dale Cooper attempts once more, and who knows how many times he has tried before, to save Laura Palmer. He is violent and does not speak a lot, a shadow of the man we encountered in the original seasons of the series. Disappointed as he may be, he does not let go. His attempt to make Carrie Page remember she is Laura Palmer and that she is still alive ends in Page Palmer's haunting scream that concludes the show in what may or may not be a cliffhanger after all. For if Laura Palmer has been a metaphor for America, as Grail Margus argues, then following the nuclear test, America has changed. This is a country that perhaps does not remember itself or the goals and aspirations that formed its founding myths. On the contrary, this is a country that again and again has been unable to escape incidents of gun violence, racist violence, gender violence, or use of force and imperial attitude in the international arena. The return, of course, um, mentions this several times. We have, for example, the shooting incident outside the WR, which is caused because a child was playing with a loaded gun uh, that found in, in the car, in the family car. So, like Carrie Page, who abandons a dead man in her living room, probably shot by her, perhaps the country does not even notice that its inclination toward violence constitutes the very betrayal of its founding myths. And uh, I'm heading towards my conclusion. And what then remains in this pessimistic analysis of Twin Peaks, the return as an exploration of America's failure? Isn't there any optimism left? To bring it down to a question of fandom, if Lynch and Frost indeed wished to offer a metaphor of America's failure, is there any need for a fourth season of Twin Peaks following the finale of The Return, which perfectly summarizes the tragedy of the country in Laura Palmer, Carrie Page's scream? Is there a way to escape the evil caused by the machine, a way to return to the Arcadia of our youth? To answer that, I believe we must go back to one of the simplest and yet most enduring definitions of the nature of evil put on paper, written by someone who saw the collapse of the Roman Empire, an empire that was founded on and was eventually destroyed by violence. Someone who experienced what the fourth painting of uh, Thomas Cole's series depicts, the destruction of the empire. Evil, Saint Augustine writes in his Confessions, is nothing but the removal of good until finally no good remains. It is perhaps then in Dale Cooper's disappointing, depressing, and bound to fail attempts to save Laura Palmer that we should turn our attention to. Despite the suffering, defeat, and loss of his personality, Dale Cooper does not let go. And in a Twin Peaks world where the garden has been lost and a return to Eden is impossible, he still attempts to do good. And if some good remains, at least in Augustinian terms, evil cannot entirely win. And we may then be lucky enough not to find ourselves in Cole's final painting, Desolation, which depicts a post-mankind landscape. And with this slightly positive comment in front of this very depressive painting, I will stop sharing my page and thank you all for your attention. Wonderful. That's such a great paper. Fantastic, Mikhail. Really enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. I love uh, I love your accompanying set of images and, and the, the paintings that you found to illustrate those points. Um, I might do as Rob suggested, and I'll, what I'd just suggest, if anybody does have a, a question um, directly uh, uh, leading from Mikhail's paper, if they could drop it into the chat and we we might move on to our third presentation and then leave some space at the end um, for some questions for all three speakers um, because uh, you know these these papers are very richly uh, responding to each other uh, so 
I will then move uh, to introduce uh, Associate Professor Robert Sinebrink from Macquarie University uh, here in Australia. Uh, Robert today is presenting a paper entitled, There's a Sort of Devil Out There, Uncanny Secularity in Twin Peaks Season 3. Uh, welcome, Robert. Hi, and uh, yes, thank you very much, Adam. And also thank you to Marissa and Frank for putting on this uh, wonderful event. I, like others, wish I could have um, attended slash um, spectated, audited more sessions, but yeah, time is what it is, as, as we know. Um, just a quick point about my time. It's actually, there's a sort of evil out there, and I'm sure that, um, let me uh, share screen now fully, if I can uh, just take a moment. Um, there we go. Okay. Um, that's actually a quote from season one, not season three, as people will know, um, but I think it speaks to the theme. Um, what I want to do is uh, basically speak to some of the images that I've uh, put up there. This one you can see and you'll recognize it from uh, season three, episode eight. And uh, the Trinity test will feature importantly in what, what I want to talk about, as well as uh, Kafka, uh, about whom uh, Daniel, uh, Adam Daniel has written uh, very eloquently uh, in regard to Twin Peaks. Okay, so just a, a brief overview of the menu, the summary of what I want to talk about. I want to explore Twin Peaks, the return in uh, light of a concept which I'm calling uncanny secularity. I'll say a little bit about what I mean by that. Um, look at this kind of dualism, which seems to structure, if you like, the Twin Peaks Lynchian universe, a, a kind of a metaphysical dualism, and related to that, the problem of evil, which we heard a little bit about already, the previous two speakers. Um, say a little bit about the relationship between Kafka and Lynch in uh, regard to Twin Peaks. Of course, uh, I have to talk about the Trinity test here. And say a little bit at the end about the idea of mythology and Twin Peaks as a kind of aesthetic mythology. And I think it's speaking to a lot of the uh, issues that the previous two speakers have mentioned and, and others as well. Uh, a kind of crisis in the sense of, um, you know, uh, American mythology, but I think also reflecting a sort of deeper sense of rupture or trauma, which uh, really underlies a lot of what Lynch's and uh, Frost's work is about in uh, this third series. Okay, so <clears throat> let me launch in. So I think it's uncontroversial to say this is Twin Peaks The Return, probably the boldest, most experimental work ever screened on television, if we want to indeed define it as a television work or cinematic television work or some kind of hybrid of the two, as uh, I know other speakers have talked about. But I think it's fair to say it is uh, quite uh, an extraordinary event. Now, there've been many different readings and approaches to the film as, as we know, some dealing with psych psychological perspectives, trauma, for example, cultural historical, referencing and contextualization to do with mythology, to do with the American dream and uh, American uh, cinema and television and so on. Uh, mythological readings as well, which uh, come into the mix. I'll make some reference to, to these readings. But what I wanna do is focus on uh, Twin Peaks as a very unusual kind of, uh, or very unorthodox if you like, contribution to what we might call post-secular cinematic television. I'm sort of exploring this idea of the, the post-secular, the idea that um, we're dealing with a context now where religious, spiritual, theological sort of themes, motifs resonate and coexist with more recognizably secular and if you like material or materialist uh, contexts. So exploring the tension between, if you like, secularist and post-secularist dimensions of post-war American culture. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, it's trying to get a handle on this very complex intertwining of, if you like, this worldly and otherworldly or materialist and non-materialist or even spiritualist perspectives, which I think are very much part of Lynch's uh, work and very evident in Twin Peaks Return. And these are expressed, of course, aesthetically as much as thematically. So it's not just a question of pointing out themes, it's also a question of the like, material aesthetic of Twin Peaks itself. Um, not least the, the, the kind of chevron zigzag design as a kind of dualism and the kind of backdrop of the red curtain, as you can see in Adam's backdrop there from uh, the Black Lodge, you know, a lot of these ideas are actually figured and configured in visual terms and audio, uh, audio visual terms, we should uh, say as well. So as many people have uh, noted, uh, Twin Peaks incorporates a rich range of uh, sources, metaphysical and mythological themes drawing on a very wide uh, range of uh, traditions and sources here. I just want to reference Frank's work here. I couldn't possibly begin to summarize it, but everything from uh, Vedic and Hindu mythology uh, modernist literature, Jungian archetypes, 
Transcendental Meditation, Greek Mythology, Dante, um, Joyce, <laughs> Kafka, uh, Esoteric and Occult Traditions, Theosophy, and the list goes on and on. So it's, it's an extraordinary work uh, that really does repay that kind of depth, in-depth sort of study. I can't really do this here, but uh, I think others have done this in a remarkable way, and I certainly want to acknowledge those approaches. Uh, but here I just want to focus on this idea that Twin Peaks and the Twin Peaks universe, and I don't mean just world, I, I, I mean this in, in a quite sort of expanded sense, remains, if you like, post-secularist in orientation. So there's referencing of historical events, of course, uh, you know, canvassing of social anxieties to do with America, but the West more broadly, one could say, and various cultural mythologies, while at the same time weaving these spiritualist and theological themes and motifs within a framework and aesthetic which we could describe as expressing an imminentist worldview. So what I mean is that, you know, much like imminentism in, uh, in uh, metaphysics, it's the view that the sort of material universe uh, is in some sense uh, manifesting or rep uh, representing or expressing uh, divinity in, in a quite material sense. And I think that's part of the sort of uh, Lynchian aesthetic, the kind of role of electricity and, um, and energy manifested through sound as well as image, as well as um, action and, and, and human presence. Uh, a lot of that is, is not just again thematic, but I think actually articulated in, in, in audio visual terms uh, throughout uh, Twin, Twin Peaks. And Lynch's work more generally. So this kind of intertwining of this worldly and otherworldly, materialist and spiritualist, secular and non-secular dimensions, uh, that's what I'm trying to capture with this idea of uncanny secularity in Twin Peaks, uh, the return. Again, I you know, would love to talk about that a bit more, but we'll just have to leave it there. I'll just flag, of course, some of these images. You can see their, their references quite explicit, obviously, to Kafka. Uh, that's, of course, Tammy Preston in Gordon Cole's office. Uh, and this link to Kafka is something which I think is, is quite fruitful uh, to explore, to understand this idea of an, an uncanny secularity in uh, Twin Peaks Return. Okay, so just on that, I want to say a little bit more about this idea of dualism. And it's a, it's a little bit of a tricky one for me, because I think on the one hand, there's this sort of dualist aspect, but as I just mentioned, there's also this imminentist aspect. And I think that's one of the, uh, it's almost like a three-way axis in, in, in uh, those terms. But just to focus on the dualism for a moment, <clears throat> I think we can see that in very obvious terms. Twin Peaks is an idealized version, as, as we heard, of small town America, coexisting with this otherworldly dimension. You know, think of the Black Lodge, the Purple Sea, Fireman's House, and its uh, host of uh, quasi-mythological denizens. So the Arm, Laura Palmer, of course, Agent Del Cooper, stuck in the Black Lodge for 25 years, the experiment, the Fireman, Senorita Dido, uh, NATO and so on and so on. So it's it's quite clear that this kind of dualism structures uh, the kind of Lynchian universe in, in quite explicit ways. Uh, look, there's lots one could say here. Let's just throw out a few ideas um, that, that others have explored as well. Uh, we could describe this as having, I think, quite a, a you know serious metaphysical kind of uh, character, a kind of structuring uh, a character, something like a Manichaean Gnosticism, uh, where there's an emphasis on the coexistence of good and evil as principles in perpetual struggle with each other within a materialist universe. So, so what I'm interested in there is the idea that, you know, I think Lynch and Twin Peaks really does speak to uh, ideas around the nature of evil, as, as we've heard, uh, that go beyond the, the more sort of conventional, secular, or psychological, or sociological views, you know, that evil is uh, either a privation of good or something motivated by psychological or sociological forces, I think there is a genuine uh, fascination with the idea of uh, the ontology of evil, or evil as a kind of ontological presence or force in the universe, which, which I'll say a little bit more about. I think that's you know one way of trying to make sense of this, this kind of dualism that structures uh, the uh, Twin Peaks Lynchian universe. And this kind of dualism provides the foundation for the series, a uh, very uncanny com combination of all these generic elements that, that I'm sure we're familiar with. Soap opera drama, crime drama mystery, the kind of surrealist sensibility that pervades uh, the series, the theological and spiritualist themes I've mentioned, you know, references to transcendental meditation, of course, uh, in there as well, various cultural historical references, including cinematic uh, references, and more speculative metaphysical reflections. So, so there's a way in which this kind of dualist uh, structure uh, uh, provides a framework for all of these different layers or elements of the Twin Peaks universe to, to coexist with each other and uh, communicate with each other. Just to take an example, 
as many people have described, Bob can be viewed as a, a kind of personification or manifestation of the evil that men do. And again, I think this is quite literally and directly figured as a metaphysical presence or reality that coexists in our world, that literally takes a form and, and a quite terrifying form in, in the figure of Bob, which can literally possess, take over uh, others, uh, Agent Dale Cooper, for example, um, and points to this sense of evil as a kind of ontological presence or force, not just as a psychological or moral or even a sociological category. Uh, just as, you know, uh, make a philosophical reference here. I think there's something very similar to what you find in Schelling, uh, a metaphysical conception of evil as ontological negativity. Right? There's a whole discussion there about freedom, essence of human freedom, and uh, you know, nature of evil in relation to, to freedom in, in theological terms. But there, there is something quite concretely um, ontological about the nature of evil in the Twin Peaks universe, which which I think is is quite fascinating. Again, as I mentioned, in visual terms, you know think of the the black lodge for example and the way in which this you know e even with the opening credits the, this kind of dualist uh, motif of the black and white chevrons and zigzag designs swirling are also set against the, the kind of red velvet uh, backdrop and um, you know this dualism coexists with a kind of very material concrete sensuous sense of um, you know experienced uh, perception and um, and um, conscious awareness so it's you know, not just a, a kind of dualism in a, in a standard sense, but it, it's something manifested in quite material and even uh, sensuous aesthetic terms uh, in, in our engagement with, uh, you know, the Twin Peaks universe. Okay, so having sort of put that there in the background, of course, let's, let's hone in again on uh, some of the uh, features of the story. Um, Lynch's work has been described, or Twin Peaks The Return has been described as something like a metaphysical detective story which features, of course, Kafkaesque elements, as I pointed to at the very beginning of my talk. Uh, there are many different um, approaches here. I mean, Adam, uh, I mentioned, has written a wonderful article on this, uh, on Kafka in, in uh, Twin Peaks. Uh, and there are all these familiar kind of themes or motifs to do with absurdity, alienation, the inscrutability of power or the irrationality of the law, metamorphosis as a theme that many people reference, um, of course, the famous story of Gregor Samsa. Um, but also more philosophically, if you like, the kind of metaphysical, I'm uh, sorry, that should be mystical foundations of authority that philosophers like Derrida and Agamben have talked about. So I think quite seriously, there, there is a, a meditation here on this very Kafkaesque focus on uh, the metaphysical, theological, and even mystical foundations of law and secular social institutions, think of the FBI, that you find in Twin Peaks. And it's not just fanciful or whimsical, I think it's part of the uh, kind of complex structuring of the Twin Peaks universe, and hence the uh, references to Kafka. So again, like Kafka, Twin Peaks The Return explores the contemporary sense of crisis concerning social and political institutions. Again, there's an enormous amount one could say here, which is really fascinating. Um, the way it pervades institutions like the law, the FBI, of course, government agencies, um, even modes of scientific inquiry, political power, and so on, linked with the sort of skepticism that, that comes in and reflects, I think, a, a, a skepticism in our world today regarding secular mora mor morality, scientific knowledge, um, you know, think of um, Dr. Amp's rants in his online uh, kind of um, uh, videos about the government, you know, shoveling your way out of the shit. Uh, there's, there's a real sort of concern with this, this kind of pervasive skepticism out there to do with rationality, scientific, and, uh, you know, official forms of knowledge you know, government and other sorts of uh, uh, institutions, almost almost a kind of quasi, um, you know, conspiratorial conspiracy theory type of uh, air as well. So that that's a whole other strand that, that I think is fascinating, but I can't really um, uh, say much more about here. Uh, again, like Kafka, we find the secular world linked with the metaphysical world. Think of the Blue Rose Task Force, uh, social institutions linked with their social underbelly, the kind of criminal underworld elements, you know, mafia and gangsters and so on, linked with these uh, kind of more secular and kind of straight, if you like, institutions. And again, all framed by this broader cosmic metaphysical background that clearly intrudes upon or communicates with, you know, I think it's a sort of portal kind of topology in uh, Twin Peaks uh, and shapes our modern world. So again, the Black Lodge, the uh, almost direct interventionist role of the firemen, you know, giving birth to Laura Palmer or sending out, uh, you know, some kind of uh, counterforce to Bob and so on. The presence of tulpas, 
you know, uh, Diane, for example, uh, of course, a string of do doppelgangers throughout the series and, and so on. But the point is that there's this kind of coexistence and, and communication between these levels, which is again, very much part of the, the structuring of uh, the Twin Peaks universe. And of course, uh, as you know, a few speakers already have mentioned, the, the key event here is uh, an event that's simultaneously historical, cultural, political, uh, scientific, technological, and indeed traumatic. And that is the um, Trinity atomic tests of uh, 1945, which ushered in the nuclear age in many ways and ruptured both, uh, as we've heard, the uh, discourses of uh, American freedom, the kind of mythology of freedom uh, on the one hand, uh, in a more cultural historical sense, but also within the Twin Peaks universe clearly function as a kind of ontological metaphysical rupture in space time in the kind of order of things. And, uh, you know, uh, in many ways give rise to this this kind of dark turn. It's, uh, you know, now it's dark, as, uh, as one of the characters mentions. And that this is something emanating from, or if you like, fallout from this kind of rupturing event. And I think, again, there's lots one could say here. It's not just uh, viewed in some kind of political or ideological lens. There's really a sense in which there's, you know, almost like in Heidegger, there's a kind of rupturing of our sense of world that happens with uh, the advent of, of nuclear uh, power used for destructive purposes, where literally the, the future of the, the planet, humanity and so on, is now something within uh, human uh, power to destroy, uh, should we choose to do so. So this, again, you know, resonates with a lot of the cultural historical anxieties in post-war America, but on the other hand, does have this, this more, if you like, metaphysical or ontological reach uh, as well. And it's again, part of how this dualism is structured within uh, the Twin Peaks universe. Uh, as you can see, there are just a few images uh, related to this uh, episode or part eight. Um, uh, got a light. Uh, you can see the woodsman there in front of the convenience store, uh, the young girl, possibly Sarah Palmer, I'm not sure, and the frog mouth. And, you know, the quite explicit link that's made between, you know, this, this rupturing of, uh, you know, the space time continuum of the kind of, you know, energy dynamics of the universe, uh, the, the kind of moral and social fabric of our modern world and the, the kind of various manifestations of evil uh, that uh, begin to pervade uh, the Twin Peaks uh, universe in quite concrete ways and literally take possession of people's bodies and souls as it were in, in quite a material as, as well as uh, if you like um, um, metaphysical sense. Okay, so just to wrap up, um, so I've talked a bit about this underlying metaphysical dualism uh, and this is, again, coupled with all sorts of syncretic elements, which I can only sort of wave at here, adapted from many religious spiritualist traditions. Again, um, reading Frank's book, I was kind of blown away by the um, layering of these dimensions, uh, not just in literary and artistic and cultural terms, but also drawing quite seriously on various religious and spiritualist traditions, Hinduism, theosophy, uh, to, to name a couple, and how all of that is brought to bear on uh, just to put it in the world, the nihilism of contemporary uh, American, but I would say more generally Western uh, society, modernity more generally, uh, this kind of crisis of, of, of belief essentially in our, in our modern world and locates the, the source of this evil, this negativity, radical sense of negativity in the socio-political as well as metaphysical and cosmic rupture introduced by the atomic bomb. So that's kind of, um, you know, an image of this, this rupturing, this, this event, which, you know, creates this cataclysmic or seismic shift in our, you know, world context uh, and the ramifications that that has, of course, for the, the characters and the kind of narratives that unfold in uh, Twin Peaks Return. So it's a mythological struggle, on the one hand, between good and evil that's endemic to humanity, uh, you know, think of the more sort of spiritualist accounts of, of, of that struggle, but it's also made acute in modernity in, in this American context. It pervades social institutions and modern communities. I mean, you know, some of the scenes they mentioned, the, um, uh, the road rage scene uh, before, the, the young boy that's run over, uh, you know, so shockingly by, by Richard um, Horn. Um, you know, Jenny E's rant about what is wrong with people today? What is wrong with our world today, right? There's this moments of kind of reflection on the nihilism of, of of contemporary America, which I think are quite serious and quite, um, you know, poignant in in the course of uh, Twin Peaks Return. I think that's that's uh, you know, part of the sort of moral dimension. 
But this is something that requires some kind of <clears throat> intervention, almost metaphysical messianic intervention in the order of the world in order for this both societal and cosmic balance to be restored. So again, this goes off in all sorts of directions, has a bit of a metaphysical Christological resonance on the one hand, but also very imminentist religious and theological resonances, uh, you know, as a sort of framing context for what unfolds in, in series three. Something like the need for Cooper to return to earth, some kind of redemption or retrieval or even rewriting with disastrous consequences of the death of Laura Palmer, a need to restore cosmic balance and a sense of societal uh, community fabric being restored as mythologies tend to do, to combat the extreme negativity of the evil force embodied by Bob, Mr. C and others within the Twin Peaks multiverse. So in a nutshell, it's something like a cinematic televisual aesthetic mythology, here referencing some of the um, ideas from German Romanticism, for a disenchanted but also spiritually cultural, culturally anxious age, uh, as, as we hear right at the beginning, it's in our house now, and uh, this is uh, what we have to deal with in our world today. Uh, I'll stop there, so uh, thanks very much. Thank you, Robert. Another wonderful paper. I'm really excited to uh, see this ex in, a, in an expanded form as a, as a written chapter. There's just so much there and so rich. So thank you so much. Uh, I might just throw to the audience to see if anybody has a question for either Robert or um, either of our previous two presenters or perhaps to the panel as a whole. A couple of comments. <laughs> Still trying to process it. It's a lot, there was a lot there, but wonderful, very rich work. <laughs> um, I might just uh, throw out a question to all three of you, um, because it is, I think something that is, is a kind of shared resonance between the three papers, which is this obviously, you know, this, um, very sort of foundational notion of, of the Trinity test in season three, as, as Robert said, as a kind of metaphysical rupture um, that, that all three of you spoke to, to some degree. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts, particularly reflecting on Mikhail's paper um, about the notion of, you know, the, the Twin Peaks of season one and two as a more idealistic um, space that has kind of shifted in the move towards season three. And I'm wondering uh, what your thoughts are on what has happened within that 25 years. So we've had the Trinity test, obviously, um, occurring you know roughly 25 years before season one and two and then we have another sort of space of 25 years and i'm curious what your thoughts are on what has ha what has happened in that shift how did the mm. twin peaks of season one and two um mm. how did it uh remain sort of protected from the effects of this rupture to some degree and why has the the, the protection um, has it dissipated over the remaining 25 years? Mm. Do you guys want to jump in? Or? Yeah, I, yeah, I can kind of start. You know, Twin Peaks always had this kind of, um, I'm going to use the term Macondo, that 100 years of solitude, you know, you can always visit, but you can never leave kind of feeling to it. Like once you were there, you were locked into the mysteries of the town. And it, and in the context of what I'm seeing, what I'm hearing from everybody here is this idea of an eventual destination toward a trauma. And I think that, yeah, there's this idea of kind of forgetfulness, a kind of moving on with life and forgetting the past in Twin Peaks is the context we got out of the books of Frost mm -hmm. and the series. But I, I, I kind of wonder if that didn't also hurt them just as well, you know, to kind of be blind to what was going in the context of those 25 years to them. And, and yet we pick up, you know, one of the blessings, one of the gifts of the show was the uh, that they allowed aging 
that they allowed everyone to age naturally and that we begin to see this. And yet uh, someone had talked about it previously, you know, Shelly's still a waitress. There hasn't been any progress uh, that they're aging without the progress or with it, they're almost blind. To, so I, I don't, that's not really answering it. Um, it's what's happened in these 25 years is they've kind of continued uh, just continued to forget and just mm. kind of survive, but without any growth, it seems. Mm. Mm. Yeah, go for it, Mikhail. So yeah, I would like to add, that from my perspective, I like to, to take a historian's perspective on Twin Peaks. I see, I, I view Lindsay's work and Twin Peaks in particular as, you know, uh, an expression uh, of America, a study of America, um, if you will. So uh, I do believe that when the original series of Twin Peaks came out, it was a time of general uh, you know, optimism, like the Cold War uh, was just ended. Uh, America was the sole superpower. Uh, freedom uh, would uh, you know, reign supreme in the world and history would end, as uh, some commentators um, wrote in the past. So it was a time of general optimism and it was natural in this uh, mental um, landscape. I mean, David Lynch always says he doesn't want to get political, but I mean, the work, uh, his work is, is political. I do believe. And it's normal in a time of optimism to go back into the, the previous times of optimism from your youth. And the 50s, of course, was a similar time of optimism in America. David Lynch has said uh, as such, I believe. So uh, I think it had to do with also the international uh, position of America at the time and the overall feeling. And the new series came out at the time after the Obama administration, which was in some respects very su successful. In other respects, uh, it didn't accomplish the promises with which uh, President Obama uh, you know, came into, into the office. And it was actually at the time of Donald Trump uh, presidency, I think, that uh, the return was screened. Mm -hmm. So I think it shows a trajectory of how America developed throughout those 20 years. It is depicted in the series, I believe. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with that. I think the, the darker tone qualities and, um, you know, the, the, the humor is still there. And, you know, we've mentioned Dougie and so on. There's these wonderful kind of uh, moments of, of, of Lynchian absurd humor and so on. But there's definitely a sense of um, the world having become dark or the American context, this, this pervasive sense of skepticism and nihilism or disenchantment with institutions, with the law, with government, with media, with, you know, and we know where all of that has led in America, particularly under Trump, you know, God knows it was, it was a horror show to watch from afar. Um, so there is definitely a sense, I think, in which that's reflected in the third series. Um, you know, the advent of technology. I mean, the, the fascinating way that the third series does incorporate technology in a more explicit way. And I think um, kind of whimsical and humorous in some ways, but but also, you know, exploring the the, the, the sort of dangers and risks and, and um, kind of, I don't know, and framing kind of qualities of technology as well as the, the enable, enabling uh, qualities of technology and how that's, it hasn't really brought people together. It's kind of atomized and fragmented and, and fermented conflict in many ways. And that, contributes to this sense of, of, of anxiety or depression and malaise. So I think all of those kind of cultural sort of motifs seem to be swirling around in there and, and, and result in this, in this more skeptical or darker kind of, kind of time. And on the other hand, offset by the extraordinary sort of visual and cinematic kind of qualities of, of the series as well, which, which give it almost like a Nietzschean relief <laughs> to that sense of, 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 of kind of darkness and, and nihilism. Thank you to all three of you. There's a, um, a question Marissa shared with us from the chat, um, which is building on the observations that you've just made. Mm. Um, mm. The question that, uh, you know, what has always surprised me about the return is the fact that 25 years in life and in universe has passed and the town is growing worse. Does this mean they're doomed to repeat the past? Mm. Sort of throw that to the, the three of you if, if that <laughs> brings any... Uh, anything mm. to the surface for you? I guess the, uh, yeah. what part of the past um, are they doomed to repeat is the, is the question there really. And there's always this idea that you know you should study history so you will laugh when you see uh, the same mistakes occurring again and again. 
And uh, like in my presentation, uh, the paintings of Thomas Cole that show the beginning, the culmination and the ending of civilization, uh, at least when he painted in the 19th century, people uh, thought sometimes of civilization in terms of circles, like um, Greek civilization, Roman civilization, uh, empires that uh, rose and uh, fell. There was also this debate about if this will occur also in America. So uh, indeed, also in Twin Peaks, um, there is this, this feeling that, you know, uh, what Dale Cooper does, he attempts to, to restore the past into a positive uh, situation, but he fails. So it's, it's always this uh, big question about what are the mistakes we are you know, doomed to repeat. Hmm. Yeah, I was, I was just going to throw in as well the, the idea of return, which is um, so rich in the series. I mean, you think of, you know, obviously sort of Freudian ideas of trauma and repetition in relation to the return. You think of Nietzsche, eternal return of the same and, you know, some kind of ethical test or challenge that that, that poses to, to us. Um, but also, you know, that whole motif of return in, in relation to Dale Cooper, you know, this is almost Odyssean kind of idea of return to home and nostalgia and, and so on. So there's all of those things. But I think that that earlier um, point you made about trauma is really important. Um, you know, this, this repetition return seems to be linked to trauma, uh, you know, both within, you know, the, the, the narrative world, you know, death of Laura Palmer in the first instance, but also this broader trauma, you know, the atomic test and where the post-World War worlds kind of went awry and what, what are the roots of that? And, and this kind of, you know, almost compulsion to repeat that, that recurs. Think of Audrey Horn in, in Limbo. I mean, that's the most tragic sort of, you know, image or manifestation of that, of that idea of being stuck uh, that 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 I can imagine, and um, it's you know it's something there in in the background, which is which is terribly um, poignant in in the series as well. But yeah, I think that idea of return and re repeating the past as a as a kind of response to trauma that seems to me really really palpable in the series in in different ways. Another great question from YouTube: um, Was the return Cooper's spirit quest that Hawke sp spoke of previously? Right, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. They're, they're, I, I came across just a little, actually one of Hawke's um, lines, something about, um, he makes reference to, to a kind of Native American idea of passing through this, um, almost like a sort of white room version of the Black Lodge and that this is um, the dangers of annihilation if, it, if, it, if, if you're not prepared. And that he was, I think he was basically referencing uh, alluding to to Dale Cooper, so you know that that's another layer which is I think really rich, and and very powerful. So yeah, I, I think that's a great point actually. Yeah, really good point. Can I jump in Greg. with a question here? Yes, please. Hey. Thank hey, you. <laughs> hey, how you going, Robert? Um, look, thank you all Hi. so much for the papers. Um. I've, I've actually just been driving in from work, so hopefully I'm, the, the audio wasn't cutting in and you could hear me, but uh, I'm here now. And um, listen, I just wanted to ask you, Robert, about the, um, the notion of uh, post-secularism that you talk about and really just, I guess, think if there's any sort of particular um, periodic break that you see that coming in. Mm. Um, so both in Lynch's work, mm. but also more generally, I guess, because I guess trying to connect back to the first paper, um, what your paper mm, made me mm. think is that, that there are all kinds of different mythologies, including the mythology of the Wild West, of course, that could almost be thought about in, some, in, in, in terms of some kind of uh, post-secular return to systems and, and beliefs in, in a post-secular age. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's a great, great question. I mean, I'm sort of digging my way into this sort of topic, but I guess the basic idea is, you know, there's this sort of narrative about the modern world is secular, you know, religion, superstition, enlightenment shifts all that, you know, we're now secular living in secular society, science, technology, reason, democracy, et cetera, et cetera. Then there's the critique of that. No, actually that, that can be very um, narrow, uh, false universalist, Eurocentric, colonialist, et cetera. Uh, you know, and, and you know, religion and theology and religious traditions play an important role. But then we don't want to end up with, you know, QAnon or, or whatever. So there's a kind of shift back towards it, but there's a coexistence. You know, even people like Habermas um, are forced to recognize that there's there's a, an important role in religion. I mean, 
my, my sort of natural way of putting it is Nietzsche didn't quite get it right. God's not dead. He's just he was just kind of resting. It's kind of come back into many multiple forms and really does still continue to haunt shape influence for better and worse, uh, you know, contemporary secular political formations across the globe, you know, Western and non-Western um, in different ways. And, and that's a big backdrop, but I think that's, you know, a lot of that is being kind of churned through in, in, in my sense um, of Twin Peaks, the return. And again, that speaks to that, you know, what's changed in, in the last 25 years. And I think that's that's been another thing. Um, and of course, you know, people's awareness of Lynch's interest in, in these kind of more esoteric traditions, you know, all the transcendental meditation kind of um, uh, work that he does. But but I think there's a serious, and with uh, Frost, too, Mark Frost, of course, you know, there's a serious um, fascination with, so how, how does our, you know, especially in the American context, you know, this sort of secular world view and these institutions that people kind of lost connection with or faith in connect with these other ways of thinking and feeling that, that people still hanker for and obviously um, find very um, important and profound and do shape our sense of um, social reality today. And how can they coexist? How can they coexist for better rather than for worse? So I, again, it's a bit in co-ed, but I, I have a sense that that's, that's one way of trying to think about how these, you know, more metaphysical, spiritualist and whatever elements coexist with the, the very sort of, you know, gritty material kind of crime story um, dimensions of, of the series. And, and so there's some serious reflection going on there, um, you know, albeit in a very kind of um, stylized and, and, and original way. Just have another question from the YouTube uh, chat uh, that Marissa's shared with us. Do any of the presenters think that Dougie represented the large amount of sleeping white Americans? Um, yeah, I'll throw that over to anyone from the, the group who'd like to respond. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, you know, I like that reading. Um, I think that that's a good reading, especially if you're being critical of the contemporary American context, which was a, just as much of a nightmare living in it as looking at it from afar the past several years. Um, the, I, I go back to a, a podcast, uh, Mark Frost did a talk with um, Scott Ryan and David Bush, I believe, just before the pandemic. It was just right there in that February. And in that, he had talked about a, um, I believe it was a silent comedian and David Bushman's in the room so I'm embarrassed that I don't just have this right off the top of my head um, but a comedian that they were referring to and I just think that Dougie fit into that essential goodness of Cooper and I think it was almost more of a statement on Dougie showed us the possibilities of goodness that maybe we can turn this thing around and but it, it so it was it was uh, it was humor for Frost and Lynch but but I think the statement is that if we can access this goodness, this portion of ourselves, and it's just highlighted in Dougie, the evil removed, that, that we can turn this political statement, all of these things we've been discussing here, and the idea of the sleeping white American, uh, maybe the, the, what is it, the dreamer must awaken, the, you know, it's this idea, but it's the goodness inside. And, you know, and then as I was talking from a regionalist regionalism kind of point of view you know i was thinking i i play with it in the the larger chapter the american dream the disillusionment at this american dream or maybe california dreaming we've heard that statement and um so, so i think that it plays into that somewhere but if i was speaking directly to dougie in this context uh i i think it was the hope in the middle of the kind of darkness yeah Do we have any other questions? Just scanning the uh, the diehard members of this uh, final panel. <laughs> Oh, great. There's the podcast. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, 
Fantastic. Thank you so much, Adam, for moderating this discussion. And Pleasure. thank you to our speakers. I think it was really rich to explore um, ideas and, and myths about the United States from both an inside perspective and an external perspective. I find that particularly rich, the exchange that we can have from these different viewpoints. Uh, I'm Thank going you. to pass the floor to Frank because we have our final panel trivia prize to give away this evening. And Frank is our prize master. Thank you, Marissa. Uh, thank you to Adam for moderating the panel. And thank you to our three panelists for their wonderful presentations. Uh, this is indeed the time for uh, li uh, the last way, uh, book to win um, tonight in Europe anyway. Uh, it's close to uh, one here in Europe. <laughs> um, and uh, the book that you can win uh, for this last question uh, is Unwrapping the Plastic, my first monograph. And in order to do this, uh, you have to answer one question that will be for the people uh, on YouTube, actually. Um, and the question is, what year is this? No, I'm kidding. The real question uh, is, um, how many actors and actresses of the list, um, of the, sorry, of the first season returned for season three? So how many actors and actresses of the first season returned for season three? also give it a go in the Zoom. You won't win anything, but you will have the satisfaction of knowing that you answered correctly, if you answer correctly, of course. There's a little delay with the YouTube stream, so we'll wait for them to hear the question and perhaps answer. Ooh. We have two answers here. I'm afraid no one has answered correctly just yet. Nice try, Ben. Not quite so many. It is a large cast indeed, but not so many. We have a guess of 12 on YouTube, but that's not correct either. Let's say that it's more than 12, but less than 150. Uh, 32, we're getting closer. Suspense is killing me. I might fall asleep. <laughs> Another guess? We might have to award the number that's closest to you. Yes. <laughs> the first person who uh, suggests something that is within five uh, of the real number will win the book. We've got it then. We do. Ismael Santos has said 35. Okay, perfect. The correct answer is 39. Congratulations. <laughs> um, I will uh, put my email address uh, on YouTube and you can, uh, you can um, uh, send me your postal uh, address so that uh, we can send you the book. I'm very sorry for uh, my speech uh, pattern that is getting very uh, slow. I've got difficulties to put my ideas together now. Uh, we've been online for close to 24 hours now over the past 48 hours <laughs> with Marisa and Roland. And it's, uh, you know, I really feel like Doggy Jones and uh, I'm, you know, <laughs> very, very difficult. <laughs> but um, we've made it. Um, this is uh, the end of the 10th panel. This is the end of this conference. Uh, I want to thank you all so much uh, for having joined us. 
uh, thank you so much to Marissa and to Roland from Lynchland uh, for making this event possible. Thank you so much to all our partners um, uh, who uh, helped us put this event together. And a great thank you to all the moderators and to all the panelists for their wonderful presentations. Uh, it's been so rich during these two days. Uh, we've had a wonderful time and we hope that you also had a good time watching all these panels. Uh, but now I'm going to let Marissa say a little something and hold on to. Well, I think I've already said my thanks, but um, you can never say thank you too, too, too many times. So thanks again for everyone who joined us over the course of these two days, who presented papers, who moderated, and also those of you who commented, who exchanged with us, and even to you, the lurkers, that's also fine. <laughs> so thank you so much. Uh, I will uh, leave the floor to Roland, our co-organizer uh, from Lynchland. Thanks, Marisa. Uh, like I said in uh, YouTube earlier, uh, I think that our best reward is, that, uh, is to see that everyone seems very happy about this conference. And uh, I, I don't think we need more recognition than, than that. Uh, I would like also to say that, uh, uh, like with the Twin Peaks series, uh, the, this conference is uh, an end, but it's also a beginning. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, uh, the videos are currently available on, uh, on, uh, on, on YouTube, but uh, we are going to rework them. We are going to re-edit re them uh during the next weeks and months because well it will take some some time and i think that uh, the, there are more than 24 hours of material currently yeah I, i've said it 24 hours uh so we, we're gonna slice them and uh during the next weeks and months we're, we're going to discuss this as much as we have discussed the show itself so there is really food for thought for quite a long time. So thanks to everyone uh, who have made this possible. Uh, thanks to Marisa and Frank as well, of course. And uh, it was a pleasure. We are quite tired now, but it was a real pleasure. And um, I don't know who the dreamer is, but I think that we are going to join him or her <laughs> to make beautiful uh, dreams uh, about uh, atomic mushrooms and so on and so forth. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. That was great. Oh, and there's one final question. After the edit, what will be the form? I think you should probably subscribe to the Lynchland uh, YouTube channel where you can find all the archival footage, but they're also going to do a great edit um, of the films, a better uh, audio quality, high quality video uh, format. Yeah. So that'll be great to yeah. have. And we will, uh, I will of course share, share them also on the Facebook page, uh, facebook.com slash Lynchman, and uh, also in the group, facebook.com slash groups slash Lynchman. So uh, feel free to join and let's keep, uh, let's, let's keep it uh, going. And also one last thing, we never thank our technicians enough. So I said it in the chat, but a huge yeah. thank you to Josh for the wonderful work of connecting the YouTube live stream and all of his help in Zoom. Thank you so much. Thanks to Josh, your savior. <laughs> good night, good day, everyone. <laughs> And it's lovely that we can see some good light morning. now. <laughs> Have a good day. <laughs> Thanks again. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.